No history of the Reach is complete without a look at Old Town, that most grand and ancient of cities, still the richest, largest, and most beautiful in all Westeros, even if King's Landing has eclipsed it as the most populous. How old is Old Town truly? Many a maester has pondered that question, but we simply do not know. The origins of the city are lost in the mists of time and clouded by legend. Some ignorant septons claim that the Seven themselves laid out its boundaries, other men that dragons once roosted on the Battle Isle until the first high tower put an end to them. Many small folk believe the high tower itself simply appeared one day. The full and true history of the founding of Old Town will likely never be known. We can state with certainty, however, that men have lived at the mouth of the Honeywine since the Dawn Age. The oldest runic records confirm this, as do certain fragmentary accounts that have come down to us from maesters who have lived amongst the children of the forest. One such, Maester Jellico, suggests that the settlement at the top of Whispering Sound began as a trading post where ships from Valyria, Old Gis, and the Summer Isles put in to replenish their provisions, make repairs, and barter with the elder races. And that seems as likely a supposition as any. Hello, my fellow Westorians. As both a target of Euron and one of the last places winter could hit, Old Town is poised to be even more important than it has been. On top of that, it has a rich and fascinating history, one that we first covered back in 2013, before not only Fire and Blood, but The World of Ice and Fire and the novellas The Rogue Prince and The Princess and the Queen. So while those episodes from 2013 are still relevant, they are missing a lot of newer detail. In some cases, the new de detail changes how we look at things. A lot of times it doesn't, <laughs> but in a lot of times it does. In addition to all the extra historical material, there's the TV show, although I don't suppose it revealed much about the books, but it might feature in the new TV show currently nicknamed Blood Moon, so there's a little extra incentive for us to get settled on what we already know to prepare ourselves. But in addition to all the stuff on Old Town, it's Ash's birthday. Happy birthday, Ashea. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. We didn't plan it this way. We do first Tuesday every month, and well, first Tuesday this month is her birthday, so how nice. It just worked out. Mm -hmm. And of course, as y'all can see, those of you who are watching, she is on this side of the camera this time, going to be um, doing even more things at once than she usually does. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. And we're very thankful. Mm -hmm. And if you're watching today, I am rocking the Michael Clark, the Michael Clarfeld West S got Essos S map strap. Yeah. But West we're talking S about yeah. really old times back when the continents were one. Yeah, sure. So at least I part of this. So Ester Wester Westeros yeah. together. Yeah, it's the Dressteros. Yeah. And if people... It's you my look, yeah, look at, I, This time it's my dress. It's the Dressos, that's right. When she stands in front of this Klarfeld map, she completely vanishes. You can't see her. It's just like a little red streak on the map, you know? Oh. So, <laughs> Pretty cool. Another place we talked about Old Town somewhat is the A Feast for Crows prologue episode, which is one of our Patreon bonus episodes. And some other parts are covered in the Great Empire of the Dawn episode. Quite a few parts there as well. Um... Some shout outs to our patrons who make all this possible. Jeff Gnarly, the long snapper, History of Westeros' first sword. Our dragon rider patrons, Telenius the Talon, King of Gagasos, Rider of Telerius, a red dragon with scales, horns, and talons of midnight black. And that's all. That's our he's our only dragon rider patron at the moment. It's it's uh it's not the uh, easiest thing to afford, let's put it that way. <laughs> so we're not uh, we're we're certainly not mad. We are very thankful for all the support we get from y'all. So we will be using some talk from the TV show today. A few spoilers for those who quit the show before it ended, but very few, nothing major. It, just a couple things that, that might give us clues as to what's coming in the books, but not much, like I said. Quick announcement. We are going to Ireland, Ashea and I, along with some friends. We'll yeah, be there. Christina. Christina from Minoli from Blood of the Podcast, yeah. And we'll be seeing a lot of friends there as well. I, sh I said traveling with friends, but Christina's the only one traveling with us. But a lot of friends will be there. Yeah, like Michael Clarfeld. Yeah. Javi. <laughs> Javi Marcos from P podcast Hielo y Fuego. And we'll get to meet uh, Ilio and Linda. And uh, we'll get to see George R. R. Martin again. And so we'll hopefully have some great uh, things to bring back to talk about from y with y'all. And um, maybe some news as well. We'll see. Someone said sound is gone. Uh, is it, it true? No, it says it's here. Okay, it was someone else. Okay. Okay. <laughs> False me. alarm. It's like, uh. <laughs> so okay. let's get to it. We don't have any other announcements. Um, we will, of course, we have lots of questions. Y'all can send us questions. We'll, we'll take those. We've got spots uh, set aside during the episode to answer questions. 
And like I said at the beginning, a lot has changed since we first covered Old Town. But really, we didn't actually focus on Old Town before. Even though we talked about some of this stuff in the past, it was really more of a focus on the Maesters and the Citadel and, and to a lesser extent, the High Towers. But so much has changed since then. For example, like right share, we knew the first time we did this, right, we, we knew that the High Towers knelt to Aegon the Conqueror. But now mm-hmm. we know his name, Manfred. We know that he was godly, that the High Septon fasted for seven days before telling Lord Manfred he should surrender based on, you know. He had we know a lot of High Tower genealogy, too. A lot more, yeah. We know his line for several generations and some of the other lines. It's called Fire tower. and Towers. It might be, besides the Targaryens, the house we have the most names for, the for most lords names, and, and people. Yeah, yeah just the, the most people. Valerian is mentioned more times um, than House High Tower. Okay. But it's really close. It's right very on. close. Yeah, so they're they're big in that sense too, and of course, Old Town being such an important place, and the High Towers being the people who have ruled it for well, we don't even know how long, longer than time has recorded. That means that well, there's a lot of time for a lot of history to pile up, and now, so that's kind of a uh, kind of a caveat that we have here. We did two episodes on Old Town and the Citadel and the High Towers back in the day. And like I said, (laughs) there's so much more to say now. Uh, There's so many small tidbits that we picked up with regards to Old Town. Some of them just small anecdotes that don't seem to matter a whole lot. But with, you know, a little bit more extra attention, we might find some things that we missed. So as always, we are heavily researched for this episode. But there's always that caveat that there's more than even we could pick out. And you know, I wasn't even that prepared for this episode because I didn't even grab my high tower shields. Oh shoot, you're right. I even have one, <laughs> a little baby one. I'll have to go. I'll stand up and grab it for you in a little At some while. Point. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we are going to speak about the Citadel and high tower, high, 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 yeah. house high tower somewhat because how could we not? They're part of uh, Old Town, but the focus is Old Town itself, and it's a reversal, like I said, from our prior coverage where we focus on the others. So let's real quick run through what's going to be in this episode and then get to it. And we're going to talk about ancient times. Um, then the coming of the Andals. Oh, yeah, including the Starry Sept, which was a crucial part of that. Then we'll have our first QA session. Then we'll talk about the Targaryens, like mm-hmm. House Hightower under the Targaryens, which includes you know the dance, some of the Dance of the Dragons, some with Jaehaerys and Aegon and Maegor. Then we'll talk about plot lines in the main series that we expect Old Town to be involved in. Uh, or, yes, they might be. And then we'll do another Q&A. Then we'll have our... Our usual meta. Meta. Old Town meta, yeah. And then we're going to have fun with, with that in the Old Town meta, talking about things that Sam might read. Like, just brainstorming all the different possible books that he could encounter for plot reasons or just because we want him to. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll talk a little bit about the Euron problem as it faces uh, Old Town and whether or not he can be stopped. And uh, all the different ways that could go. And then we'll end with another uh, set of questions from y'all. So, you ready, Ashea? Shall we get to it? Yeah. Let's do it. All right. Whoops. Mm-hmm. Got to f- refine my place in the document here. So, Ashea's got a cool map shot for us. This is Whispering Sound. It is basically the area that all this started. It's You can see Old Town on the screen there if you're looking or if you look at the map later. It's a large bay that in current times resides in the southwest corner of Westeros, right? There's a thing you knew already. But in ancient times, it was the southwest corner of a super huge continent that we just tried to name. West, 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 mm-hmm. Drest, we, just, we didn't have a name for it. <laughs> it's not a Pangea because it's not all the continents, you know, but it's like a Pan Georgia where Essos and Westeros were one. Not Georgia like the mm-hmm. state, like George R. R. Martin. Oh. Mm. <laughs> You could walk all the way from Old Town to Ashai back in the day. Not that many people probably did that, but sailing there, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, it would connect a lot of isolated inland places to the rest of the world, right? Or at least it could. Lannisport, whenever it came to be, would mostly trade with Old Town because it's the only nearby major port. Why would you sail past Old Town to trade elsewhere when you could trade at Old Town? Well, you might have reasons, but for a lot of people, keep it simple. Uh, and, of course, there's other important places that we don't even know about that used to exist, right? We can only imagine, like, other trading partners that no longer exist. Mm. Like, can you imagine them trading with, uh, like, the Summer Isles back in the day or 
Ashai and Karth yeah. and all that. They still trade with the Summer Isles. So, yeah, I think I can imagine that. Yeah, not too hard to imagine, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they would not have had place uh, sea trade with places like Sarnor and whatever peoples lived where, say, Pentos and Kohor and Norvos and Lorath are, if any, because, again... If the you know the stepstones were a whole landmass, well, you couldn't exactly sail from Old Town to those places too easily. Well, not without a flying ship. So we hear that humans lived in this area as early as the Dawn Age, and you know it wouldn't make a lot of sense if they didn't, uh, given how connected it all was. Humankind spreads out, and uh, while the carved faces on the weirwoods were scary, whispering sound was meant to be found. Hey, I, I rhymed. <laughs> Because it's not a hidden remote spot, right? It, it's just just a nice natural harbor, natural port, natural bay. It appears to be one of the earliest draws in the region for human settlers. That would that would make a lot of sense. And it was certainly one of the first to thrive, if not the first. And it's extremely notable that Old Town is really rich then and now. And it recent and until recently, it was the center of the faith. After centuries or eons of that, as well as the founding or the foundation, rather, of learning in Westeros via the Citadel. So, uh, extremely rich, center of the faith, center of learning. But on top of that, and despite that, because this is not something friendly to either maesters nor septons, it is a strong association to the higher mysteries as well, which might be a big part of why Euron is coming for it. And, well, a lot of other people have too. Old Town had to grow to become what it is today, grow tougher, more protected, more savvy, and a lot of these traditions and structures are still in place today doing the same job they did so long ago. So, Shay, let's talk about... Remnants of ancient times. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're told that the Ravenry is the oldest building there, right? Yeah. Yeah. They did not need a boat to reach the Isle of Ravens. A weathered wooden drawbridge links it to the eastern bank. The Ravenry is the oldest building at the Citadel, Alaris told him, as they crossed over the slow-flowing waters of the Honeywine. In the Age of Heroes, it was supposedly the stronghold of a pirate lord who sat here robbing ships as they came down the river. Right on. So there's a, there is still a weirwood there, which is interesting because it's partly dead, but the branches that are still living are where the ravens roost, which tells you something, though not something directly related to this episode, but it definitely tells us something. And it's covered in purple moss in parts, which sounds cool. I don't really know what the deal with that purple moss is, but it sounds kind of cool. And we know now that black and white ravens fight. And probably some symbolism in there somewhere. <laughs> but I do wonder if there were white ravens back then, you know, like when the Citadel first started, the first ravenry. Do you think there were white ravens back then? I mean, do you, what do you think? Someone bred ravens? Maybe. Maybe they bred the albino version. They're larger. It's yeah, possible. I don't know. That's why, that's the question. Is if you yeah. think they were bred, then that makes it more likely they didn't exist. Yeah, that's a good call. I, I actually didn't think about the, the specific breeding that much, although it's interesting that they're no longer, uh, they don't like each other. <laughs> now, of course, this is all linked to the children, right? This is the uh, an ancient link between the Citadel and high, the High Tower and the children of the forest, who supposedly taught early mankind the speech of ravens it said ravens used to read the messages aloud instead of carrying papers which is like can you imagine that the ravens just sitting there talking instead of mm -hmm. corn corn they like speak in whole sentences <laughs> it's pretty wild and the high tower of course is built on this black stone uh on battle isle and we don't we've talked we've covered the oily black stone elsewhere in our great empire of the dawn episode we don't need to rehash that it's really cool really fun but i want to point out if y'all haven't listened to the world of ice and fire on audiobook that roy detrice just really gets into it this part when he talks about battle isle and and the confusion and the the historical mysteries there he's like what battle was fought there it's interesting to me how he just seems to really get into it one one notion is that the high tower was already there, and that the high towers were already kings before we even got the first written records. And it's entirely possible that the high towers are a different genetic stock than other first men, given their potentially unusual coloring. We're not clear exactly on long uh, on their coloring because we don't have a lot of examples. And uh, and of course is the idea that they would have migrated by ship rather than by land. Yeah, the only coloring we really get concrete on is blonde. Yeah, we got like some silvery hair, but that yeah. could be age. Yeah. So we're not sure whether it's kind of ambiguous. 
Um, it's unlike the Danes, where although I will say in the art, Allison has darkish hair. That's true. Yeah, there's no in the art, it doesn't look special at all. Yeah, but again, the art is not necessarily what you want to hang your hat on right there, so yeah. to speak. Like. I mean, there's art where Tywin Lannister doesn't have green eyes. Yeah, that's true. So, <laughs> We're know. also talking thousands of years <laughs> later comparing, you know, ancient high towers to now. And, of course, the genetics will not unlikely to have shifted somewhat with all the intermarrying with the Andals and everyone else. If, if they weren't first men, well, they certainly married first men and Andals. So, anyway, here's another cool quote for us. The reasons for the, aban- the abandonment of the fortress and the fate of its builders, whoever they might have been, are likewise lost to us. But at some point, we know that Battle Isle and its great stronghold came into the possession of the ancestors of House Hightower. Were they first men, as most scholars believe today? Or did they mayhaps descend from the seafarers and traders who had settled at the top of Whispering Sound in earlier epochs? The men who came before the first men. We cannot know. A nice compliment or comment from Adrian Gabeyu here who says that the, oh. the voice of Old Town is... Uh, uh, one of the many <laughs> strange titles that the high towers pile on themselves, and the, they reside around Whispering Sound, which I wonder if that's a related. He wonders if that's related. Now I do too. Um, good question. So here's where I admit we're cheating just a little bit. This is entitled Fire and Blood, Old Town, but really a lot of this is from the World of Ice and Fire. We do have lots from Fire and Blood, but this ancient stuff is World of Ice and Fire. The more modern stuff, once Aegon the Conqueror comes on the scene, that's the uh, Fire and Blood influence. And surely, when we get Fire and Blood 2, hmm. we'll get some more Old Town boogle, stuff. Electric boogle. Uh. <laughs> that never gets old. <laughs> so, s- skipping over the Blackstone stuff and the Great Empire, except to point out one little funny detail that is completely unrelated to this. Just in looking at the Blackstone, we discovered that there's two other references to Blackstone that have nothing to do with the oily Blackstone, in that... When the, Sen- the Seneschal of the Citadel, who is an Archmaester chosen by Lot, they have to do this kind of thankless task that none of the Archmaesters want to do, and they draw lots for it, and the loser is the one who pulls the Blackstone. <laughs> that also comes up with uh, the people starving in Yunkai when they're deciding to eat each other. They draw lots to see who gets eaten, and the loser is the one who picks the Blackstone. So, yeah, I don't know if that relates to anything, but stumbled across that this, this time and thought I'd throw it out there. So, yeah, we learned that Uthor of the High Tower supposedly commissioned Bran the Builder or his son to start the High Tower. Like, just Bran the Builder just really got around. <laughs> I think it's really notable how many of these early High Tower names are really evocative of like Arthurian legends. Yeah, yeah, your Uthor is and Uthor Paramore, Pendragon. And, you know, I don't know. They just all all are. Paramore the Twisted is just right out of that kind of legend to me. You know, it would be interesting to study the High Tower naming conventions because you're right; like they definitely seem to change. You've got like Uragon, which sounds sort of Greyjoyish, or not Greyjoyish, but uh, Iron Islandish. Yeah. That you're right about. I totally agree on Uthor and Paramor sound Arthurian, but then like in later times, he has very normal names so like Norman, Manfred, and, and, Manfred and, Martin. and Martin. Yeah, <laughs> so very kind of standard English names, and so he's kind of maybe reflected the different eras of of the High Towers and the different you know cultural influences by, you know switching up the naming styles, which is almost certainly intentional. Mm-hmm. So Prince Paramore was the second son of Uthor, and he's he really the, important. He was the Twisted. The Twisted, yeah, that's not a very nice name, is it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> he supposedly was the main guy who started the Citadel, along with his older brother, eventual king, Uragon. They, they both had a hand in it, but Prince Paramore was the main guy, and he would just apparently just give money to scholars and bring them to his court and just listen to them talk. He really liked it, and, and they were called... Paramore's pets. Okay. I have a question, though. <laughs> sure. Do you think Paramore had a Paramore? <laughs> he was a high tower. He probably had a few Paramores. Okay. Paramore's Paramore's Just... and Paramore's pet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so these pets were essentially the first maesters. I don't think they were called that. They may have been, but eventually, somehow that name came. We don't know how the term maester came around, as far as I know. Um, now... Old Town is currently ringed with massive, massive walls. And that is important because back in the day, well, it was hard to defend and Old Town was such a great target. As Old Town grew wealthy and powerful, neighboring lords and petty kings turned covetous eyes upon its riches and pirates and reavers from beyond the seas heard tales of its splendors as well. 
Thrice in the space of a single century, the, ci the city was taken and sacked, once by the Dornish king Samuel Dane, the Starfire, once by Corrid the Cruel and his Iron Men, and once by Giles Gardner I, the Woe, who reportedly sold three quarters of the city's inhabitants into slavery, but was unable to breach the defenses of the high tower on Battle Isle. Now, uh, that, by the way, this Giles Gardner, the woe, selling three quarters of the city's inhabitants into slavery, but was unable to breach the defenses of the high tower on Battle Isle, that really sticks out to me because, as we know, Euron is aiming for uh, Old Town. And he's the kind of guy that potentially would sell a bunch of people into slavery, even though it's not Westerosi law. He doesn't care too much about that. But the idea that he that this G Giles Gardner and and actually being back up the woe of course Euron specifically says what do dragons bring woe he's looking to well, woe he's looking to bring woe to Westeros so the use of uh, of these terms is maybe intentional by George but I still wonder and we're gonna like I said get into Euron later but remember this part because it's kind of been taken for granted by a lot of people that Euron will be able to do this. And breaching the defenses of Old Town is one thing, but getting into the High Tower is an entirely different matter. And I'm not as certain, certain, certain yeah. that he'll be able to do that. So keep on, keep that. What do you think about that? Do you think, uh, or you, have you taken? Does that apply to you? Are you someone who kind of assumed that he would take this, the the High Tower as well as these other things? Or no, I don't think he would take the High Tower as well as other things. Okay, you think the Citadel? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think he'll like right, like sack Old Town. I don't think he's gonna do much to keep it yeah i would tend to agree with that point. so if, i think he's gonna sack it and yeah i move on or yeah take the wealth and i mean i guess if he's military. on a dragon at that point which i really don't think he will be then he could do something to the high tower but i just don't think he will have yeah. one at that point so i think he won't i think i agree that he won't have a dragon by that point yeah i think he, i think he very will very likely will have one but not at this point i think you're right about that but if he does, whoa, that changes everything. Then all of a sudden, he has a lot uh, different way to get in there. So they, they learn from all this. They learn from these attacks by King Samuel Dane and Corrid the Cruel and Giles Gardner. And they took pains to prevent it from ever happening again. That's where these walls came from and these defenses and other things that are, you know, maybe a little more detailed that aren't actually mentioned, whatever specifics they, they've taken up. But from here on... Old Town, rarely, and we're still pretty early in the timeline here, but from here on, almost never, not never, but almost never, Old Town rarely suffers. Even in times of turmoil and chaos, they find a way to just keep doing their thing. They don't get involved in the war. They play both sides a little. Even when the High Towers get embroiled in the Dance of the Dragons, right, where they are the Greens, basically, or at least a half of the Greens party, no armies ever attacked Old Town, even in the Dance of the Dragon. Not even a dragon came there to with, with fighting in mind. It was just, yeah, they just avoided that. Uh, maybe that's because they're so far down in the south, but I think right. it's noteworthy. I mean, they were they were attacked, certainly, um, and the massive walls, you know, knocked them back. Like, they were attacked in recent times. Right, but it, yes, I'm the saying Dornish. they didn't really suffer too much. Yeah, the Dornish, yeah. and they ransacked the towns that and is, villages outside Exactly, of it. that's one of the not-never that I was referring yeah. to. <laughs> yeah, they, they were attacked, just not uh, infiltrated. Yeah, yeah, it's much, it's really difficult to do that, so. Which is why sneaking in might be a better. And that is trick. what we yeah. see Euron doing. That's yeah. a great call, yeah, because Euron, yeah. remember, if we were Recall one of Euron's ploys was to have some dudes dress up like Tairashi, dye their beards, and try to like get on in. So yeah, subterfuge can definitely succeed. You're, you're right. That's a really good angle to consider. That if Euron's military strength straight up is it enough? Uh, maybe sorcery and or subterfuge could be the way to do it. Now, interestingly, to look, it's it's said that from the top of the high tower you can see the wall. I'm not sure if that's true, but it's certainly interesting and evocative. <laughs> but the two have some things in common. Over time, long periods of time, just like the wall got bigger and more expansive, so did the high tower. Yeah. I I think it's impossible for the high tower to see the wall. That from seems there. pretty I, crazy, yeah, right? I don't. I do not think so. <laughs> that seems wild. Uh, yeah, just, uh, <laughs> That's so far yeah. away. <laughs> I just had to clarify that. <laughs> and but unlike the wall, the high tower seems to have gotten stronger over time, more defended, whereas the wall, more recently, has kind of dropped off in its defenses and infrastructure and uh, certainly manpower. That's the biggest one. 
If they had a burgeoning city there, it would be different. Good point. Yeah, exactly. there's no there's no trade really, hardly any sort. <laughs> they even have a rhyming town. Instead of old town, they have mole town, but yeah. it's quite a bit smaller. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like I said, surely there are setbacks for the high towers, but they mostly just kept getting stronger, continuously reinvesting in the city and infrastructure and defense, and that just paid off. This remained true even as the kingdom of the Reach formed because they were high tower kings kind of ruling the, the, the local area by themselves, but they bent the knee to the gardeners, and the last high tower king married a daughter of House Gardener. He was Lymond. Uh, he was called the Sea Lion. The sea Lion. Uh, uh, a high tower called the Sea Lion. <laughs> Go figure. I don't know. I have a really vivid image of anyone named the Sea Lion. Yeah. Like I picture them like kind of whiskery. <laughs> Personally. Okay. okay, well, now I'm picturing that, too. Okay. You got me. <laughs> <laughs> and this, so this guy, there's still a statue of this guy, Lyman, in, at Old Town now. So like so many, uh, he's following in that same tradition, or perhaps starting it, maybe one of the guys who kicked it off, which was the Hightower's taking the path of peace and profit rather than war. He's, he's thinking to himself, we could fight these more powerful gardeners, or we could just kneel to them and keep doing what we were doing minus a little bit of tax revenue and occasionally having to send some soldiers but overall looking at the balance sheet well if, if they're first they don't they care less about or if they care more about profit than you know pride and, and self-rule uh, you know then well very pragmatic you gotta say and what the sea lion said too was that he that the, the protection of house gardener was important in a in a kind of a meta sense to the same way that the high towers are to old town itself which is that their protection of the city has a big role in enabling the flourishing of the faith and trade and learning which is exactly what lord lyman's point is he's our king well king then lord lyman since he knelt he says is he lyman the kneeler like uh, torin <laughs> <laughs> the king who knelt <laughs> and uh that would allow them to he's exactly what he says he says well with protection of the gardeners we can now look out into the world we can delve inward and outward and and spend our resources learning rather than worrying about defense as much so that's nice you know you got to have patronage to uh to have uh the ability to not uh spend all your time where, worrying about it, where you're going to eat next. Hey, you know? we know that. We do know that very well. <laughs> we don't have the uh, the high towers supporting us, but we could <laughs> have that in VR. A new tier. That way, yeah, right. The voice really, of old the, town. The, old, the super expensive. No, we'll just have tier. voice of old town. Voice of old town. Hey, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, uh, it's, it's it's nice to have real patrons. Um, <laughs> no, at the high towers. <laughs> having a super ultra rich patron like the high towers is a bit much to expect, I think. <laughs> they could build us our own citadel, just buy us like every version of every George R. R. Martin book ever. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I liked that uh, they mentioned Lady Sam Tarly, you know, she was the lady of Old Town and she just, you know, brought, you know, a maester back because she wanted his learning. Yeah, and she did not want to give up that position either. She's like, this is a good spot to mm -hmm. be. And but you could see, and apparently that was one of the things she she uh, valued about it was the learning. It wasn't just the like, I'm a powerful person with lots of money. Hmm. So moving onward to the coming of the Andals. What do you think of this Lord Dorian Hightower fellow? Is, this, is Dorian more of a modern name or? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's I think kind it's of in weird. the middle. We don't really see that name. Yeah, is there? I don't think I can think of any other Dorian. There's Darian, but not yeah. Dorian. Yeah, there's a lot of names in Fire and Blood, and you know, in, ge in general, in the histories that aren't repeated nearly as much as you would think. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I agree. So Lord Dorian Hightower, he got ahead of the Andal invasion, meaning uh, took the initiative. He could see where things were going. He could see the Andals were winning. He could see that nearly all the major seats were being taken by them, and. Uh, to be fair, he had more time than most High Lords to react to the Andal invasion because they're so far into the southwest, which is, you know, the and Andalos is right across the straits from, uh, well, it's Bravos now, basically. So it's right across the straits from the Fingers. So it's really far from Old Town. But still, he set aside his wife of 20 years and married an Andal princess to avoid war. 
Um, so war didn't hit Old Town again. They avoided war, and it was business as, as usual, I suppose. Lord Dorian had children with with this wife he set aside, and maybe had children with his new Andal wife. We don't actually know. So, and we also don't know who inherited. So we don't know if the Andal blood initially passed down, but surely it did eventually because yeah. there was more Andal marriages after that. Yeah. Yeah. So one way or another, the Andal blood got in there. And of course, Andal culture, even more importantly, well, probably more importantly, <laughs> with this is magical blood, if, with, when magical blood is a thing, we don't know that for sure. But now we have Lord Damon. And now this is D-A-M-O-N, not D-A-E. So that is more mm. of a modern version, I suppose. So he was the first to convey Convate? Uh -huh. To convert to the faith of the seven. Lord Damon was the grandson of Lord Dorian. Um, and he died young. His infant son Tristan inherited the region. Yeah, Tristan's another one of those names. It's just like very knightly, very, you know. Yeah, that's a, that's an Arthurian name. Yeah, exactly. Tristan, yeah. It just, yeah, it just makes me think of, you know, whatever he sold Good and point. all that. I don't know. Yeah, I wonder if the naming convention switches around here when they convert to like Andal culture. Maybe that was one of the, the switches. Yeah. And maybe again, there's like another. Yeah. switch sort of around the time of the dragons maybe i don't know yeah. just just a kind of a off the cuff theory and to be there. clear we're not the first people to point out the the similarities in these high tower Definitely. names you're yeah, right it's like yeah. very apparent yeah they stand is. out yeah they do now lord damon this this the grandson of lord dorian who was the first to adopt uh an andal princess or adopt to <laughs> marry an andal princess <laughs> So he died young, and this is this infant son, Tristan, that we were just talking about. He inherited from Lord Dorian, and since he was too young to rule, he had a regent. And the regent uh, was Septon Robeson. And this Septon Robeson was apparently the effective ruler of Old Town for around 20 years, which means he continued to rule even after Tristan became of age, because obviously Tristan would have been 20 after 20 years. <laughs> it's a very hmm, tricky math there, huh? How do I, how did I figure that out you should, maybe you should check my math there what if it, do you think it was sept in robes on he's wearing his robes <laughs> robes <laughs> on holy crap so, yeah, that's genius do you think there's sept in robes, robes off <laughs> there should be if there isn't he was kicked out of the faith for <laughs> being uh too uh naked <laughs> robes on that's awesome i love it so, but when Lord Tristan, so this was effectively the first High Septon. I'm, I guess they called him that, and because it seems to be, it seems to indicate that the sources, the sources, the World of Ice and Fire and Fire and Blood, well, just World of Ice and Fire, I think, seems to indicate that he was the first High Septon. And when he died, Lord Tristan clearly thought highly of him, or at least wanted everyone to think he thought highly of him, because he built the Starry Sept. Now, how mm -hmm. cool is that? Starry Sept is still important now, although less important than it was. Uh, it's a huge Lovecraft reference, the Starry Sept, the Church of Starry Wisdom, but relating Lovecraftian stuff to the Faith of the Seven is a little strange. So that's not really where we're going to go with this right now, but we did go there in the Great Empire of the Dawn episode. Tristan's son, Barris, B-A-R-R-I-S. You know, that's another that's one. a really weird one. Yeah, I'm Barris. Just, really not similar to any other names, let alone Hightower names, not repeated. Yeah. I don't know. Weird. And yeah, so this this that was the first crystal crown given by Barris. So these guys continued to support the faith and and uh, spend money on them and and be friendly. And uh, the, many of the of people in the in Westeros saw the High Septon as sort of the spiritual leader, if not the leader of Westeros, in the time of the Seven Kingdoms when there wasn't one king to rule them all. Oops, <laughs> wrong fandom. <laughs> and when there was one king to rule them all, when the Targaryens came, of course there were plenty of objections to the Targaryens from a cultural perspective, but those problems usually emanated from the halls of the Starry Sept. Most of the High Septons who opposed the Targaryens for various reasons did so from the wall, behind the walls of the Starry Sept. And uh, even when Aegon came, there were still some who looked to the High Septon rather than him. Although not for long, <laughs> since even the High Septon accepted Aegon. So, here is what Old Town symbolized to many, uh, well, many who are religious. Old Town became their holy city, and many devout men and women traveled there to pray at its septs and shrines and other holy places. Doubtless, it was in part due to these ties to the Seven that the High Towers were so often able to keep themselves separate from House Gardener's countless wars. 
Yeah, there you go. And that's that's really a big part of what it's all about, this constant theme of the Hightowers finding out how to stay out of war, which is, you know, there's a modern equivalent to that. If you have a lot of money, you can stay out of war. <laughs> well, I mean by going to war. You may not stay out of the effects of war, but you and your children won't have to go fight in them. That's that's what I mean. Although that's not necessarily the case in Westeros as much because there's plenty of times when the High Towers went to war. Yeah, I mean they were they would be attacked by someone, and it's a matter of honor. And yes, they're, if they're if they're you know vassals are attacked and they don't do anything about it, then they're yeah. not going to be very loyal to them. So yeah, they they very have true. to get re, you know vengeance, revenge. I don't know. So, they still have to yeah they have to they have to prove that they have the the stomach for fighting and they have to stand up for their pride, like you said. But whenever possible, yeah, will they avoid it? Right, you know, there's, 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 it's one thing to to get back at someone who's who's wronged you, but if you never get involved in the first place, then you know you can avoid those entanglements, and that is that is certainly a big part of of their approach, and it's maintained for so long. So the power of the faith is still very strong in Westeros, and as things stand in the Song of Ice and Fire, it's on the rise again. An interesting example here of Baylor Blacktide. He's kind of a case study. He's an ironborn lord. Uh, well, he wasn't a lord when he was sent there. I don't think. I think he was uh, his, the heir. And he was a hostage after Balon's rebellion and sent to, well, Old Town. He was uh, a hostage in Old Town for eight years, kind of like Theon. And he returned to his ancestral seat after eight years. But in that time, kind of how Theon started to become a little more northerly, a little more Stark-like, well, this was an even more dramatic transformation. Balor Black Tide became a full-on devotee of the faith, and he maintained it even after returning to the Iron Isles. It didn't go over too well with uh, Euron, though. Balor Black Tide refused to uh, bend the knee to him, and he ended up drowned in a casket of seawater. Side note here, Balor's ship is called Night Flyer, which mm -hmm. a lot of y'all will recognize as one of George's short stories, and it was made into a TV show, one um, a miniseries. And uh, so George is nodding to his own work here. The uh, later Seven Kingdoms period prior to the coming of the dragons is a period in history we don't know too well. So, you know, we know the stuff about the faith and that, but as far as like politics and wars and, and all these other things like relationships between the gardeners and the high towers and other things like that, we don't know a whole lot about that, so we're going to skip ahead to the arrival of the dragons. But first, let's take a couple of questions that we have here. And we have a cat patrolling around as we're trying to grab him and put him on screen. Yeah. But he's just, just out of reach. Yeah. So um, look at that. A, a super chat from Stephen Stark. He says, get yourself a little something nice. Ashe Aziz, you can't have any of this. Thank you. What does he mean? I can't have any of that? Like he's saying, you can't have any of this. <laughs> well, Stephen, I am so disappointed. <laughs> but thank you uh, for, um, for the super chat. <laughs> K to the Canals asks, seat of a pirate lord foreshadowing for Euron. Mm -hmm. Kate, you nailed it. I've got that note in here. It's coming a little later, but mm -hmm. well done. Well done, Kate. That is exactly what I have planned to talk about. So that's coming. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tommy Pappas, a.k.a. Hema Helminth. Very large super chat. Thank you very much. Doesn't seem to have attached a question to it, right? No, I'm sure it was a message was happy birthday. <laughs> no, it's all for or you. Happy it's, name a, day. it's actually all for you, Z. Oh. <laughs> He's just rubbing it. He's like, this is for Zeus. You don't get anything. <laughs> and also a super chat from Karen Sita. Happy birthday, Ash Hart. Smash the like button, people. Yes, please do smash the like button. You'd be surprised at how much that actually matters in terms of uh, hitting the YouTube algorithm. And also, it just we just it makes us feel happy. Mm -hmm. You know, we feel appreciated when you like our videos. By the way, people are appreciating your straight out of Old Town shirt in the chat. Oh yeah, you straight know, out of Old going, Town. Straight out of Old Town. This maester named Marwin. <laughs> <you know. laughs> he went sailing on a ship called Dolphin. Yeah. Uh, no, he didn't. He went on some other know. cinnamon yeah. wind, I think. <laughs> but he, yeah, I don't well, know. Cinnamon, Marwin. No. We could find it. Could work. Okay. We need we need Christina's help. We'll come back to y'all with a Old Town rap of some kind. Or not. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> so as I said, let's uh, move on to the times where House Hightower and Old Town lives under the dragon, which a time that only ended recently and may come back. By the time of Aegon's conquest, Old Town was beyond question the greatest city in all of Westeros, the largest, richest, and most populous, and a center of both learning and faith. Even so... It might well have suffered the same fate as Harrenhal if not for the close ties between the Hightower and the Starry Sept. 
for it was the High Septon who persuaded Lord Manfred Hightower to offer no resistance to Aegon Targaryen and his dragons, but instead to open his gates at the Conqueror's approach and do him homage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Aegon, like it said, homage, he, I don't homage, know. homage. I think they're I, both correct, I think. Yeah, um, I, whatever. <laughs> Two in my head. Uh, so Aegon, you know, he had a kneel first fight if you don't kneel kind of attitude. So he gave everyone the chance to kneel. And of course the Northerners did, the Vale did, Dorne certainly didn't. <laughs> and neither did the High Tower, or not rather the Tyrells and Lannisters who had the field, not the Tyrells, the Gardeners and Lannisters who had the Field of Fire. The High Towers were not at the Field of Fire, however. So good for them. And instead they did kneel here. And what we're told is that the High Sapton Septon? High Septon fasted for seven days. Of course, seven days. I bet he wished it was the faith of the three. (laughs) (laughs) Why why are there seven gods? I'm so hungry. Mm -hmm. So Lord, he tells Lord Manfred that he had visions of of Old Town and the Sept burning if he didn't kneel. I don't know about those being visions rather than just like a common sense prediction. (laughs) It's like, hmm, dragons? Uh, I've got visions of dragon fire. I don't know where they're coming from. But that is, you know, kind of a normal way to spin things that the gods told us that. So the people have more confidence in it or why ever they do it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so many people thought actually that Aegon would make Old Town the capital. Yeah, he even visited there with Visenya before he began his conquest. So he got to see how big, I mean, and given that there was no King's Landing, I mean, it's like the idea, it makes a lot of sense, right? Like why would you build a new city when you could take this one over, this incredibly awesome, powerful city? But I guess because it was, maybe because it was so so non-central, that was an issue. Yeah, that is true, it is very non-central. Yeah, that's probably the biggest issue with it. There might be other small issues. Yeah, but. King's Landing had the benefit of being very central and very near Dragonstone. Yeah. So it just, as well as closer to uh, the east, like mm-hmm. the, the Free Cities, which is pretty relevant, uh, less more relevant than it had been, but definitely relevant. And to be honest, it's better to have another city in Westeros than it is to just have one that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, and there would be no question of loyalty, like, you know, loyalty to the to the old regime. You know, mm-hmm. Aegon might be wary of people still, you know, holding out for the high tower or being around all these faithful. He might rather just do his own thing and not have to be around all these people of questionable loyalty. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, better to do it his own on his own. Mm-hmm. But still, it was thought at the time he would do this. And he was crowned there at the Sept, just like... All the other kings have been in, until more recent times when they're crowned at the Sept in Wester, or in King's Landing, which is the Great Sept. Yeah, after being crowned, uh, Aegon also picked out the very first Grand Maester. Yeah. He also kept like a bunch of maesters around him, period, but he made a Grand Maester. And so the first Grand Maester was Oladar, who studied history. Nice. He had the bronze <laughs> yeah. chains and rods and all that. But the second Grand Maester was Leonce who had yellow gold links, you know, well, rod and all that, which is mathematics and economics, nice. which is interesting to me alone just because of, you know, Aegon needed that sort of thing. Yeah, starting the realm up with taxes, yeah. and this is the first time the kingdoms had ever been united. Yeah, yeah. economics would be huge. That's yeah. a great point. Speaking of the names, though, Oladar and Leonce, yeah. or Leonce. <laughs> Beyonce, it's Beyonce's Westerosi brother. <laughs> These are not standard English names, on the other hand. I've never seen the name Oladar before or after that I know of, and definitely haven't seen Leonce. <laughs> or Leonce, as you said. I don't know which is accurate, but I will, like George says, we can pronounce it the way we want. I'm going with Leonce for I am sure. Too. <laughs> so the. Conquest, of course, wasn't complete at that point, even though Aegon was crowned. As we know, the Darnish had not submitted at that point. And this created some openings when Aegon was invading Dorne. The Danes struck back and they pillaged the area around Old Town during what's called the First Dornish War. And this is what Ashea was referring to earlier about them burning a lot of the villages around Old Town and uh, destroying, you know, the, the smaller towns or the things that weren't behind the walls, basically. And Sir Joffrey Dane himself kills Sir Garmin Hightower, Garmin of, of House uh, GPS. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's exactly what I was thinking. By the way, can I just say, there's a really good message in the chat from Acre Frey. 
you take over a city, you are a conqueror. If you build a new city, you're a builder and looked upon better. And then Koi Venozi replied with, Minus 40 formal vassal of things. Which is a CK2 joke. Crusader Kings 2 jokes making Anyways, it in. I love it. I Good just call. had to point it out real quick. It was making me, <laughs> me smile so much here. We love the CK2 references. Mm. Uh, so Aegon was able to keep things pretty tight, except for, you know, these Dornish, this Dornish incursion. Uh, the old town was pretty quiet uh, during his reign. Now... Things changed, though, when Aenys and then Magor, in particular, came around. Now, Aenys' reign was endorsed by the faith at first. He was, you know, he was a nice guy. He was willing to work with people. You know, he wasn't maybe the smartest guy, but he was genial, and, and that helped. And he didn't, and he, you know, wasn't married to his sister. <laughs> well, he didn't have a sister, but that helps. And he wasn't the son of incest either. Well, he was the son of incest, but his grandparents weren't. So it's uh, there was some wiggle room there. Hmm. But uh, that but that changed because he arranged for his daughter Reyna to marry his son Aegon, Aegon the Uncrowned, and uh, well, that didn't go over so well. They lost their cool predictably, and Aenys was surprised, which I don't know why he was surprised. <laughs> that seems like it was kind of obvious, but hey. Like I said, Aenys wasn't this, wasn't super smart. Now, but it's really the Magor stuff that stands out as the peak of this conflict. Uh, Cerise Hightower was Magor's first wife. Now that's the daughter to Manfred, and uh, which is not the same Manfred who knelt to Aegon. This is Manfred's grandson, Manfred. In between, there was an Adam. It's boyfriend. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> so this is Manfred the Kneeler's uh, great-granddaughter. Oh, wait. Yeah, great-granddaughter. No, granddaughter. Yeah, I don't know why I wrote great-granddaughter. It should be granddaughter. And uh, Oh, no, it is great-granddaughter. Yeah, Manfred, then Adam, then Manfred, then Cerise. Okay, so I had it right the first time. I should have trusted my notes. And he, of course, nothing was wrong with this at first. This was a... A totally fine arrangement. It's a high tower and, and a Targaryen. That's nothing wrong with that. But Magor then re gets a second wife. He goes all polygamous, and uh, that doesn't uh, that doesn't go over so well. Now, as we know, there was a, a bit of a conflict here, and this was getting to the point where it was going to get ugly. We have Visenya and Magor both heading down to. Uh, the high tower to the old town to settle things, and we know how Magor and Visenya settle things, so that's not good. And the High Septon was was standing up to them. He was like, "No, this isn't going to happen. We're gonna we're gonna fight against this." But Cerise's uh, brother Morgan is probably the one that kills this angry High Septon, which allows for a new High Septon to be chosen, one that isn't you know, sending Old Town to the flames. <laughs> this new guy comes up and is like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll do whatever y'all want. Magor, Visenya, you're cool. We Whatever you want, we're not fighting you. You have Balerion and Vagar, so you win. I mean, smart call, right? <laughs> like, they're standing up to authority and then there's just standing up to a semi-truck on the highway with your fists and mm -hmm. that's just not going to cut it. Uh, so interestingly, we also have another interesting high tower here. Interestingly, we also have another interesting high tower. Very, uh, very repetitive of me there. We have Patrice. Another name. And you're like, w wait, what? <laughs> Patrice. Patrice. That's like, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm not going to say anything more in case we have listeners named Patrice. <laughs> yeah, you know. I like the name Patrice, but it doesn't seem to fit here. You know, I agree. It's a little odd. And then Lord, uh, this is Lord Martin's sister, and she was rumored to also have been the one to kill the angry High Septon. So. Basically, different rumors about different high towers killing this high septon. I mean, they're both high towers, so I mean, it seems like it could be very much a group effort. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've been in on it together, yeah. like like the red wedding, the red uh, <laughs> septoning. No, it doesn't mm -hmm. work. So Patrice was notably rumored to be a witch, which uh, <coughs> which uh, excuse me, mm -hmm. which is uh, comes up again with. Other high tower scions um, as women who are delving into magic. Yeah, obviously we have Melora, the Mad Maid, <coughs> and uh, that should, we would hope, we would think, come up when Euron comes to Old Town and we see Leighton and Melora. 
So, and it, it seems more likely what with this discussion here of another female high tower who yeah. supposedly does magic. It I seems agree. like we will see oh, this is all BS, or oh, there might be some truth in this by seeing her character. I agree, and we'll we'll obviously, like she said, we'll get back to that later, and I, I uh, to clarify some of those points even further, but yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement there for sure. Morgan himself was uh, later killed by warrior's sons, um, so this, uh, you know, the, the in a rare case where the high towers were against the faith, but uh, that was not a long state of affairs. Um, Magor held court in Old Town for six months. He stayed there for a while, sorting things out, keeping things, um, I don't know, intimidating people. Magor doing his thing. And the same High Septon who totally reversed the prior High Septon's position on standing up to Magor and Visenya and the Targaryens. Not only did he give them what they wanted, but he did something that that almost no High Septon would have done, which is he performed a triple marriage ceremony for Magor. Like, <laughs> three more wives for this guy who's already got too many. And this, of course, causes a split amongst the faithful. Some of the faithful are like, nah, this is going way too far. It's one thing to just do what you have to do because you'll be killed otherwise, but this is, this is just too offensive to the gods. And this is the rise of Septon Moon that we're talking about here. And, of course, that doesn't go very far. It's interesting to consider whether Lord Donald the Delayer, who will be speaking on in greater detail soon, whether he uh, had Septon Moon murdered which is entirely possible, like his yeah. family had the actual High Septon murdered before. These are all entirely possible. I think almost 100% the case. Yeah. I, tend I mean, to, he tend was to a, a big troublemaker. He yeah. couldn't live. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. And along these same lines, uh, or just another fun detail here, Rayella, twin of Araya, who of she of the awful journey on Valerian, or technically, technically <laughs> Araya, you know, other way around, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she was raised in Old Town and and lived and died there apparently as a member of the faith, and uh, she, was she was visited by her yeah. mother, yeah, yeah, by Raina once a year, supposedly mm -hmm. flying down from Harrenhal to Old Town. I think Alisan saw her too. Yeah, you're right. She did. Alisan, because Alisan chilled out there. And that, in fact, chilled out there. We're going, she did kind of chill out there. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get a little bit more into Alisan's visit there because a little bit later, because it has more to do with some books that she looks at. Yeah. But um, Jaharis goes too. Yeah, Jaharis uh, and Alisan both spend time there. He There's a statue of him at the Citadel. Yeah, that was a new thing I'd never noticed. There's yeah. a plinth on his statue, and it has a little. Little, uh, in, in, you know, is inscribed with something. It, it would be easy to think that Septon Barth came from Old Town because, you know, all the learning and faith, and he was such a learned, faithful guy, so important to Jaharis. But no, he came from High Garden, which is uh, also a center of learning. It, Did it, he, spe he specifically came from High Garden itself. How yeah, interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, it makes sense for him to come from a place where there would be books. So he could have that base of learning, I suppose. Yeah, it's, it's specifically mentioned, and I forget if it's the World of Ice and Fire or Fire and Blood, but it's mentioned that that High Garden is particularly strong in that area, even though it, um, you know, is is overshadowed by Old Town and some other places. But it's it's a good center of learning, more than by far, more than most. Yeah, places. I think they reference Willis too as having you know books. Yeah, I mean, yeah, good point. Bookish. And Willis would just would certainly encourage that, spend money on that infrastructure, probably to inc yeah. improve it. One would hope. Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition to Jaehaerys and Alysanne, their son, Vagon, Vagon uh, the Dragonless, as he's called, mm -hmm. who becomes an archmaester and later helps the realm with the Great Council after so many of his brothers and sisters die or mm -hmm. leave the country. A really good section about Vagon where, you know, when Jaehaerys is asking, you know, he asks the Grand Maester, do you think I should send him to be a maester? And the, maester, the Grand Maester's like... Eh, I don't think he can be a maester, but he could be, you know, an arch maester, which He's is like, a really funny idea that, like, if you can't be a maester, be the thing at the very Yeah, time. that's the option to the high nobility yeah, of the be, royals. Like, you can fail upwards, though. Yeah, which makes some sense because Vagon was, wasn't the kind of person that would be good at teaching or maybe could stomach, you know... Uh, dealing with broken legs, as they said, and injuries. Yeah, yeah it's like, can you imagine him delivering a kid or or writing letters for some other lord? And, and Jerry's is like, oh, yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah no, he would never do that. <laughs> yeah, he was a real, uh, real uh, prude. I don't know. Just Yeah, I mean, in my arrogant. queer women and my different LGBT panels I've done at these cons, a lot of people mentioned Vagon as an example of someone they read as asexual in some way. 
Mm. Um, because, yeah. I mean, we even see, like, he was given a book with uh, erotic drawings. He didn't give a and crap. He didn't, I mean, he kept it, but he didn't seem to care about it at all. But, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a good point. Really... Yeah, it's, it's a, I like that theory. It makes a lot of sense. Um, and even much later, this is all, you know, early in Jaehaerys' reign, but much, much later, he was celebrated again in 89 AC with a tournament uh, just in his honor. In old Jaehaerys, town. to be clear. Yeah, Jaehaerys, not, uh, <laughs> no, not Vagon. Not, not like humorless <laughs> Vagon. <laughs> a tournament to celebrate this guy nobody likes, <laughs> who has <laughs> no <laughs> descendants. Uh, so, so, so let's go back to Donald the Delaire, who we don't know when he became Lord, but it was at least by 48, if not earlier. So maybe during the reign of Aenys, definitely by the time of Magor, and certainly all throughout the realm, the realm, the reign of Jaehaerys and Alicent. <clears throat> now he's another... Perhaps one of the most classic examples of how the High Tower Lords play both sides and how they focus on peace and profit and living good over war and fighting for nobility and honor and things like that. And here's a quote that just really kind of nails all that. Lord Donnell is a schemer and a sulker, said Manfred Wet Red Wine. I do not trust him, nor should you. He does what he thinks best for himself, his house, and Old Town, and cares not a fig for anyone or anything else, not even for his king. And then I must convince him that what is best for his king is what is best for himself, his house, and Old Town, said Jaehaerys. I believe I can do that. Yeah. There's another Manfred name, this one another with a Y. One. Yeah, this is Manfred with a Y. <laughs> <laughs> and so Jaehaerys opposed... The faith's radical elements, just like, and Donald Delaire did as well, while supporting the traditions and the High Septon. Now, except for, you know, the ones he maybe had to kill to, in order to do both of these things at the same time. So apparently what happened was he bartered with Jaehaerys over all this, apparently agreeing to the doctrine of exceptionalism in exchange for the future High Septon coming from High Sow Tower. I keep doing that. House High Tower. I think you're saying Heis House Tower. <laughs> and that happened pretty quickly because they agreed to name this really old guy, Septon Alfin, to the High Septon position. And he wasn't around long because, well, he was a really old guy. And the next one was 54 AC, and that's Donald's brother. Ah, yes. Mm. A lot of you guys will remember Donald from our Sun Chaser episode. Yeah, it's Donald who's Lord during Alyssa Farman's venture. And Donald lives up to his name by delaying arresting Alyssa until the very last minute. And then his Thankfully. grandsons <laughs> join her instead of arresting her. Yeah, that was so cool. We've <sighs> covered Alyssa extensively, like I said, in Sun Chaser episodes. So you can check that out if you want to refresh her. But if you, just as a quick overview, Norman's ship was taken down possibly by a Kraken. In fact, that's my headcanon. It's, it's not entirely clear, but a high tower ship getting taken out by a Kraken. Ooh, interesting. Whether that happened or not, there's the idea of it Planting that seed in the head is like, yeah. Also, Norman. <laughs> no, Norman. Like, yeah. I guess Normandy. And it's just Again, like, yeah. not making fun of the name Norman. I like the name Norman, but it's a little, seems a little out of place in Westeros. It'd be like having Greg Hightower, you know, or you know, Aziz I mean, Hightower. we do have, like, Samantha <laughs> Tarly on at this point. So. Yeah, that's true. Aziz is... Could be, could, your name could be in there. I, I think that would be fun. You think so? I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> so Eustace, though, did make it back from that extremely dangerous and, and harrowing voyage. But they uh, had incredibly valuable cargo that they brought back, which presumably the uh, high towers just threw on their giant wealth pile. I think they probably have a room like the Boltons have for skins. The high towers just have a room where it's like Scrooge McDuck. Yeah. You can just jump into the gold pile. Oh, you don't want to jump into any gold piles. Well, in cartoons, yeah, you can yeah. swim in gold, but yeah, yes. you're right. In real life, that would just kill you. Face plant. <laughs> <laughs> but I imagine they just tossed all the money in there and then just forgot about it. It's like, we are so rich. It's insane. <laughs> <laughs> now, Eustace's family, though, not Eustace himself, including Lord Donnell, his dad or granddad, died to the shivers. Now, Port's have that problem, meaning being very susceptible to disease because you got people coming from all over, bringing all kinds of diseases and uncleanliness and people aren't exactly the most uh, hygienic on ships. They're not the most hygienic at, in general at this you know time period and setting. And uh, we are joined by Xerxes the cat whose mm -hmm. eyes match the map very nicely. Mm -hmm. And well, <clears throat> so when you think of the shivers, well, it makes you think of other magical diseases 
we covered the shivers and uh, that other disease that's slipping my mind, uh, <coughs> that other cold disease. And we'll have grayscale um, in the Song of Ice and Fire. So it's very relevant to look at how these diseases affected Old Town in the past because we have another one that might impact it currently. Uh, but we'll get to that in a bit. We're not up to grayscale yet. We've got the Dance of the Dragons, which we're not going to cover in great detail. Obviously, it's just too much of, a, of its own thing. And it doesn't really involve Old Town that much. It certainly involves the High Towers a lot. But, like I said, it's a bit much for trying to cover all that at once. Otto Hightower was hand uh, two different times during um, Viserys' reign and then during the dance itself. Aegon II... Well, and his sister wife, Helena, and his brothers, Aemond and Daron, were all half Hightower. Queen Alicent, of course, even more important than Otto Hightower. But none of those descendants survived that we know of, right? Daron, Aemond, Helena, Aegon, none of them lived. None of their kids lived. Although Aemond did have a child with Alice Rivers, the witch queen of Harrenhal. And her, that kid's fate is unknown. And there were also apparently some false Darons. Uh, because Daron's death was, was so... Um, unproven at the time his body wasn't uh, recognizable that you know there were some pretender kings and maybe this involved the old town and the high towers not unlikely since daron the original daron was a cupbearer and squire to lord hightower otto's brother i believe that would be lyman or yeah i think it's lyman and uh, or ormond anyway it doesn't matter we'll be getting and lionel it's lionel that's right and so when you think of these pretenders and the high towers, it kind of reminds you of young Griff, right? And well, there's a good reason for that. And we'll come back to it because we're not there yet. But the green support, obviously very rooted in high house, house high tower. I did it again. And I think it's interesting that there are green sphinxes at the Citadel, uh, kind of marking the entrance. And the sphinxes are a symbol of Valyria. And well, green sphinxes, green dragon. Yeah, that might've been something George did on purpose. It might just be coincidence. So not only it's so the pattern continues here, right? We have the long-standing knowledge that Old Town is just really good at even when they get into a war, they 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 manage to come out ahead. This is a good example. Despite all this war, they lost you know members of their family, but Old Town itself didn't suffer. Uh, they, in fact, Tyland Lannister, who was in charge of the treasury for Aegon the Second, split it up into three spots and to hide it. And one of those three spots was Old Town. And apparently that money was returned, but not all of it. Sir Miles Hightower stole some of it. <laughs> so so it, it seems that Old Town even somehow profited from this war, even though they were on the losing side, which is just bonkers to consider. Like, geez, talk about wealth and privilege. I mean, it, it, people talk a lot about how being poor is expensive, you know, because you can, you know, wealth gets you out of certain situations that are very costly. What is a perfect example? These guys lost the war and they came out ahead. Like, what the heck is that? And it, it, it was better than that for them during the aftermath because they didn't have any money invested in the Rogari Bank, the Lysine Bank. So when it collapsed, as we touched on in our Bravos Faceless Man episode from last month, well, High Towers had not invested in the Rogari Bank at all. So it was kind of addition by subtraction. A whole, a whole bunch of other families lost a bunch of money, and they didn't. So by comparison, they were all of a sudden richer, even though they hadn't directly gained anything. And this is when they formed the Bank of Old Town, which is really interesting. That's something mentioned in Fire and Blood. hasn't been mentioned before anywhere else. And considering the rising importance of money in the Song of Ice and Fire with like Littlefinger doing his thing with the with the grain futures. Uh, also interesting, that thing I touched on earlier with Lady Sam, this is where she brings someone to Old Town because she brings Lotho R Rogare to Old Town to help teach them um, some money oh. uh, handling tricks. Lotho is the one who gets his uh, right hand cut off and he's like, well, it's lucky that I'm left handed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, she, she brings him there to teach them. And so the Rogaris did have a hand beyond that and a hand, pun intended, one hand in uh, right forming <laughs> Forming the uh, the Bank of Old Town in addition to just their destruction helping them to form in. 
Yeah, that's a great catch. I didn't. I forgot about the Lotho Lotho's involvement. So that is certainly how they learned how to do banking. Almost certainly. That's. Yeah. That, I assume that's your point. Yeah. That's. Yes. That's. Yeah. That's a great catch. I, I would a hundred percent assume you're right about that. Now, of course, like I said, they even though they didn't have direct consequences uh, from losing the war, uh, they would probably have suffered indirectly because you know trade would slow down locally, regionally, and all around Westeros because the whole re- the whole realm was was wrecked by the war, and it was winter during the aftermath. So, but again, Old Town has ways around this because they're a worldly city trading with internationally. I don't know if that's the right term to use, but you get the point. And so all these other places around the world wouldn't be suffering like Westeros was, so they would still be able to do quite a bit of trade. In modern times, thinking about that bank, I'm wondering, you know, the crown owes money to everybody. They borrowed from the <laughs> Lannisters. They borrowed money from the Iron Bank. They borrowed money from other lenders. I wonder if they also borrowed money from the Bank of Old Town. It seems very likely, even yeah. though it isn't explicitly mentioned. So, Yeah, do you think there's any <clears throat> chance that the Bank of Old Town is defunct, that it doesn't exist? Uh, anymore i think i don't think they, i doubt I think, it yeah i doubt it too but i just it had m- to wonder it might become defunct shortly <laughs> if euron gets a hold of, of, <laughs> of something or sacks the city uh but mm, we don't know that's a good that's a it's a it's good good thing to consider though for sure and uh so yes it is lionel hightower who inherited after the death of his father during the dance that's the this is a 15 year old and um it was his father who had lady sam <laughs> as, as his lover, this was yes. now that's this is his stepmother, not his actual mother. Yeah, yeah. His his father was married to Lady Sam, and then she was like, "I'm not done. I'm not done being the lady of Old Town, right?" Yeah. And so you know, Lionel was pretty young, and she's like, "Hey, hey, what's up? What's up?" <laughs> and of course, like, and this the, is important because Lionel yeah. first was like, "No, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna raise the army. We're gonna go back to war." Yeah. And in, and she's like, Very you, if you do that, like. we can't get together. Yeah. And so he made the decision. Okay, I, I choose you. He's like, I choose you. Choose you. It's like <laughs> war or or Sam Tarly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh. And uh, of course, though, then the High Septon does not approve of yeah. this at all. It and it not. takes them like thirteen years or something like that until. Find like a new high septon is chosen, and then that guy is like, that guy's like, okay, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You guys are clearly you guys have been together longer than she was married to your father. Yeah, anyways. and they had a bunch of kids together. Like, and yeah. yeah, Lady Sam's also the one that when the high septon's like, you know, I, you're not allowed to set foot in the starry sept anymore. So she goes in yeah. on a horse. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> I didn't set my feet in the, in the starry sept. <laughs> so she's really cool. So the remainder of the High Tower history, we're going to roll into what's coming because there's ties to these stories to the modern story, and so it kind of makes sense to discuss them side by side. But first, let us take a mid-roll break. We're about halfway through, and it's time for some shout-outs. And... Yeah, we got a couple questions here. Cool. Yeah. Um. Well, one was just a, a super chat here from Craig Mulvey, twenty dollars and a sticker that said, "Thanks for being you." All right. Well, thank you for that, Craig. We appreciate it. And we also have this one from Abort Consciousness. So, what I've been asking myself is how, where the Maesters handled before the Targs came along. Why would the High Towers grant anyone outside the Reach one? Well, I assume because they wanted to. Uh, help, they, they, they were invested in educating Westeros. I think there's value to, <clears throat> to education can lift a lot of people up. And when you have a more educated populace, you have more trade, more merchants, more people that, well, that's just more, that's good for the realm. It's like, yeah. it's the kind of things that people at the top of an economy can do to affect the economy from the bottom up. And um, I'm not sure that that's their thinking. Maybe they just... It's a matter of pride and honor where they want to be the ones sponsoring education and learning all throughout Westeros. And that's uh, that gives that's a point of pride for them. Yeah, because, I mean, some people might think the high towers are extending their reach through control, but they don't actually have that sort of control over all these maesters. Yeah. Right. Like even if they did when they sent them out, they sure as hell don't now. Yeah, that's true. You wonder, I mean, out, out of all the centuries that have passed, there's probably been some high tower lords that probably looked askance at all this money they were putting into the Citadel and the yeah. Maesters. And they may have been like, had some mind to kind of reverse some of that. But it's such a strong in place system, it would be hard to kind of undo that. 
We yeah, have I'm so sure, many I'm sure lords. The Citadel just makes a lot of, a good amount of money at this point. Too. Probably, yeah, they probably do. It, I don't no. know. I don't know if it can self, you know, fund yeah. itself, but I, I feel like those. it could. You need all the money for all those links, yeah. <laughs> especially the gold links and the yeah, Valyrian steel. That's true. <laughs> Not to worry about the iron and the bronze too much. <laughs> all right, so let's say thanks to a few folks. Um, let's start with our. Let's do our cell sword captains this time. They're due for a nice shout out if I can find them. We've got Peter Blaze of the Emerald Isle, captain of the Werewood Wanderers to Long Lives, Quick Deaths, Cold Beer, and Warm Women. Dagron, Marshal of the Axe, captain of the Red Tide, Resistance is Futile. Chiron Calls Bane, captain of the Stone Shields, The Torrent Breaks Upon the Stone. Hema Helminth, captain of the Whispering Children, Dead Men Tell No Secrets. He was in this, he popped up in the chat today with a super chat. <laughs> and he's also one of our History of Westeros mods for the Facebook group. Shepard, the Shepherd of Essos. All men are sheep before the Shepard is heir to the Whispering Children. Lady Lajara Dajo is the Iron Lily, Master Archer, Castellan of the Summer Island Keep, Arboreal Point, and Captain of the All-Female Wailing Widows. Women and Children First is their motto. Cody the Crimson is Bastard of Bracken, Captain of the Red Waste Exiles, and Recruiter of the Free Folk. Cameron the Hammer of Hornwood is Captain of the English Lions with the motto, Honor is the Reward of Virtue. Lord Brandon Brewer of Castle Blackrune is Captain of the Shadow Wolves. Our Steel is Cold, Our Vengeance Colder. Black Alex Sand, the Bastard of Spears, is leader of the Bermuda Vanguard. Bitter Steel, Captain General of the Golden Company. Beneath the gold, the Bitter Steel, and our word is good as gold. They're cool enough to have two mottos. <laughs> and also want to give shout outs to our Queens of Love and Beauty. From the depths of Flea Bottom, Lord Ken of House Hammer has declared for Queen Kari, Fire of the North, who recovered Dark Sister from beyond the wall. And a Laurel of Glory in the name of love to bud of house beresford knight of tolkien and arbiter of scotch from sandy the dragon blood of queen daenerys and lady of jameson we also have our blood rider patrons who include vorsaki wielder of a valyrian steel eric with a dragon bone hilt koa koi called sun piercer wielder of a dragon bone bow and kakaba the tamer wielder of the wildfire whip gehenna um, if you, even if you know, even if you aren't rereading with us or at all, you can join our Valar Reread Us podcasts. We're, you know, there's no, we're talking about enough familiar stuff that you don't have to be rereading along. And I know it's difficult to stay on a schedule when you've got a Song of Ice and Fire in your hands to, to stop reading at a certain point that someone else determined for you. That's difficult. Now nah, you just keep going. That's what I would do. Yeah. So please join us for Valor Read Us. We're having a blast of a time looking back over all the foreshadowing of things we didn't realize were being foreshadowed, catching new clues. And yeah, it's just super fun, really fun. And of course, if you are into rereading and haven't, and are finding yourself with short of time um, to sit down and read, maybe try out Audible, you can get two free downloads with an Audible trial subscription, meaning you pay nothing if you don't want to keep the subscription. And even if you don't keep that to subscription, you get two free downloads and those downloads stay even if you uh, don't stick with it. So, uh, I would like to point out for anyone who doesn't want to listen to audio books, um, an option that I have a lot of luck with is Google Play Books. Because if you make a note in there, it'll automatically populate a document in Google Docs with all of your notes linked to the page number and all that. And just in terms of if you want to have a resource with all the quotes that you're interested in it's really great so that's my little uh advertisement for something that uh needs no advertising right on that is yeah, that's really useful i mean it, it just plants yeah. your notes just like that that's, yeah i that's can powerful. look at my fire and blood document and just get to anything that's right great on. okay well let's see here next up we have yeah things that we expect old town to get involved in uh that are going on in the song of ice and fire and in a lot of cases, they involve touching on historical incidents that are quite similar. So those give us a lot of times to give us foreshadowing and parallels to what we might expect to happen. At some point, the center of the faith moved from the Starry Sept to the Sept of Baylor. So clearly after Baylor's death, because he started building it, but it wasn't finished during his day. So 171 was when he roughly when he died. So at some point after, that's when this this happened. And <clears throat> So, so it's less relevant as it could be uh, because the High Septon is based in King's Landing now, whereas the Starry Sept had been the seat of the Seven in Westeros for at least a thousand years. So, well, now, of course, it's not the yeah. High Septon at all, is it? It's the <laughs> yeah. I mean, do we think, that, I mean, if the Sept of uh, 
Baylor, I mean, do we think that the You'll sept get. is going to get destroyed in some way in King's Landing? So maybe it'll have to switch back to the Starry Sept. Good point. Or maybe yeah. the Starry Sept will also get sacked in this Old Town attack. Probably. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good. That's a really tough question because you're right. If we're, this is when we this is when there's some minor TV spoilers. So, uh, yeah, be aware. Certainly, Cersei blows up the Sept of Baylor on in the TV show. Now, I think it's more likely that all of King's Landing gets wildfired, which would include the Great Sept. So either way, that seems to be in the cards. And so either way, the Baylor Sept is toast. And so you're right, Starry Sept might go back to being the center, but not if it's been done in by Euron. Although I mm -hmm. doubt he just destroys the whole building, you know, like, it's like take down the stone and everything. Like, he's not going to have wildfire. Uh, probably. <laughs> so we'll have to see about that. But that's that's an, that's that's very hard to predict, like you say, because there's we could we could end up with both of those places being destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> and that is something Euron would like. I destroying all the centers likely. of religion. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more likely to be honest that yeah, both are destroyed. Yeah, that certainly would play right into his hands. So maybe we should be considering that. Uh, this is coming up live. We we hadn't really considered that both would be destroyed when we were writing this episode. And now live we're like yeah, that fits. That does fit. That's cool. Now, uh, so like I said, of course, it's the High Sparrow now. <laughs> and that's two High Septons that died during the books to get to the High Sparrow. And one of those High, uh, high Septons was killed by the mob, and the other one was killed by Osney Kettleblack on Cersei's orders. So Old Town is shaking its head in shame over that, but they probably had a high septon or two killed as well, or seven or 12 or <laughs> a lot. Yeah, just a lot. So a lot of, uh, another major plot line coming is, is Young Griff, uh, or is happening rather. And so we really have to wonder which side Old Town will take. If they will just do their usual and play both sides, well, maybe. <laughs> Here's where I bring up those green sphinxes again and remind you that they're, that they, they're on the green side. So if we ever get into a modern dance of the dragons, the modern greens, the parallels to the greens might be the side the high towers take. And this is before our, you know, I was referring to those false darons, and this might be uh, related to that. I mean, if we're thinking Old Town gets attacked and the high towers are, you know, hurt, will they even have much of a chance to get involved? Will they just escape with a lot of people? I don't know. It's really tough to say because, like you said, um, like you're on the, the taking of Old Town could go so many ways. First of all, it could not happen. At yeah, all. it could that's not happen. probably will. It probably will, though. Probably will, but it depends on, you know, it could happen at a certain moment that's after yeah. they've pledged one way or have sent out some of their people. Yeah, like, that's a great point. Like, it, it's hard for them to go send troops to join either army, either fight against Young Griff or for him when they're so concerned with Euron. Yeah. Uh, so And when, yeah, bar like, Young Griff is just barely in Westeros and yeah. Danny isn't at all, so why would they support anyone right now? It's a good point. They might want to kind of wait and see how it happens. Uh, let, let things play out a little bit uh, and play well, and they can, they've got an easy excuse. Like, we're, we're a bit busy over here dealing with this other guy trying to claim the crown. So they could say, hey, we're fighting on your behalf by attacking Euron, by fighting Euron. It, but both of them, <laughs> like we're helping the Lannisters <laughs> by fighting Euron. We're helping, <laughs> we're helping the uh, Danny. We're helping Aegon too by fighting. Uh, mm. the, the, I, this, there's some room for yeah. some creative uh, negotiating here by the High Towers. Now, uh, so the current Lord of of the High Tower is Leighton, and uh, well, there's some very interesting political considerations here. And but as an aside, we talk about hands, and um, well, Aegon the Sixth probable hand of the king has a little something wrong with his hand <laughs> which uh well we'll be talking about that shortly as well as we build up to grayscale we've had lots of little things building up to grayscale here but first the political considerations of lord layton he was he's been married four times which as an aside that's fishy if not scary like four three dead wives man what is up with that mm -hmm. it could be natural but you know that's that's a little hmm, that's cause to wonder we don't know what the houses of the first three are there, so that doesn't uh, doesn't tell us a lot about the politics there. But this current wife is a Florent, and this is where it gets a little tricky, because it's not as simple as being oh a Florent. Well, they sided with Stannis, right? Sure, they did. But Rhea's father was Lord Alistair, as in the one that was burned by Melisandre for trying to broker a peace with the Lannisters that Stannis did not authorize, as in the guy who shared that cell with Davos. So that's not the best reason to stick with Stannis, although the Florence still, to this point, are with him. Now, Alistair's son, Alakine. 
Alakine. Now that's a yeah. name that's not modern or <laughs> or anything else. I don't know where that one came from. That's cool. I like that one, but never seen that one before. So he is technically the Lord of Brightwater Keep under, you know, Stannis or certain laws, but that's in dispute because the crown, the Lannisters and Baratheons uh, conundrum there, <laughs> gave it to Garland Tyrell. Now, Garland was getting ready to assault slash besiege Brightwater, but pause those plans when Euron attacked the Shield Isles. His first concern is that. Meanwhile, Alicane is hanging out in Old Town, waiting for an opportunity or for things to die down. But to make things more confusing, Alicane and Rhea have another sister, and it's Samwell Tarly's mother, Melissa. Now, that's the real Samwell, not Sam- Samantha Tarly <laughs> from, from a while back. The Tarleys appear set to join young Griff, right? Because of what Randall said and all his, uh, you know, friends in the Reach. And if he's, re- if there really is young, you know, if he really is Aegon, blah, blah, blah. If it really is the Golden Company. So that's going to make them enemies to the Tyrells. Uh, so... But it's even more complicated than that because Leighton supported Renly over Stannis, but switched to the Lannisters, not to Stannis after Renly's death, as evidenced by the crown giving him gifts after the Blackwater. Again, he didn't show up. He stayed in the high tower the entire time, but he still got gifts, <laughs> even though he didn't back them initially. Like, again, failing upwards because of extreme wealth and power. And the reason this could be expected, though, is his grandchildren. These are characters we're pretty familiar with, yeah. aren't we? Lord Leighton Hightower's grandchildren. Who are Lord Leighton mm. Hightower's grandchildren, you We've say? We've got Willis, Garland, Marjorie, and Loras. <laughs> and of course, some of them we are less familiar with. Yeah, we don't know Willis and Garland that well, but we want to. <laughs> yeah, that's because his daughter, Allery, is married to Mace Tyrell. Yeah, so this is some serious embroilment of both. Mul- he almost has to play both sides because he's married into both of them. He has kids with both sides. It's also notable in terms of our discussion on their genetics and what they look like. That's that very true. Allery's uh, children do have dark, br- you know, have brown hair. Allery is, I think, one of the people that's described as having silvery hair, but yes. that's because we don't know how old she is yes. and all that. Anyways, this is an aside, but I, I think the genetics are really interesting. They are. Oh, yeah, I totally agree. Um, and then we have, to make it more confusing, because, hey, Leighton Hightower has 10 children, so that's, you know, well. <laughs> He's gets, no Walder Frey. He is no Walder Frey. But his marriages are, are in a lot of cases, even more entangling. There's uh, Baylor, a.k.a. Baylor Bright Smile, or... If you ask Oberyn and Elia, Baylor Breakwind <laughs> is married to Rhonda Rowan. And the Rowans are one of the other fandom's top picks for Young Griff's Fringe in the Reach, along with the Tarleys. So, and Lord Rowan has outwardly expressed disgust at Tyron Lannister's, uh, some of his, the way he handles himself. But like so many others, rising against Tywin is no small thing. So, well, now Tywin's gone. So maybe uh, we'll see the, uh, the Rowans make a move. But he also has a daughter married to House Ambrose, another married to House Cups, a son married to House Fossilway, and a daughter married to House Redwine who share this danger posed by Euron. In fact, the Arbor has already felt the crow's eye's wrath. And along with the Tyrell kids, there's a Redwine grandson and an Ambrose grandson. And arguably that makes those marriages more important to some degree rather than the childless ones. So very, very entangled. I hope that made sense. I don't think it made sense to me, and I wrote it. <laughs> uh, well, George wrote it, but, you know, I wrote this stuff just now. <laughs> and, of course, there's also the daughter, Lanasse, married to Jorah, but uh, politically she doesn't really matter at this point. She's still not even living in Westeros, as far as we know. So that's nine, uh, or was it nine kids or ten? Because I have nine written. I thought it was ten. But there's two unmarried and one do- two, two unmarried sons and one unmarried daughter. And the unmarried daughter, interestingly enough, is the eldest one of the daughters. And that's the aforementioned Melora, the Mad Maid. Mm-hmm. She and her father have supposedly been consulting spells after Euron's attacks. Now, you made a great point earlier that comes back around here that maybe that's just kind of an exaggeration. Maybe they're just reading some books and like trying to you know strategy or studying or something it doesn't necessarily mean they're consulting spell books like no but who would even know that other than maybe some servants you that's know? true too and i mean they could also be looking at books that pertain to magic while not actually be able to do anything magical or know whether it's real or not yeah maybe they're like looking they could up... be looking at arcane type of of mm. uh not you know books i suppose Without her being a witch. 
<laughs> She's just a mad maid, not a witch. <laughs> But a little aside here to just dream on how glorious the Citadel's or the high, House High Tower's private library stash must be. <laughs> must be really sweet. The Citadel, of course, has so many great books, but this private stash must be just. Ah, oh, they wipe the drool off here. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to grayscale. Uh, and Euron at the same time, sort of. What could Euron do with all the people of Old Town? That's a question. We talked about the G Giles, the Woe, sending them all, a bunch of them off into slavery. Um, you know, if it weren't for Euron, we might be thinking that winter would be coming all this far south, but maybe it won't. Starvation setting in all the way down here? I'm not so sure that would happen, but, um, especially because they have such a you know, they're a port. They could get food from elsewhere, and they have so much money to buy that food. So I really, I don't know about Old Town starving, at least not through normal means. Not through, not because of winter. I mean, maybe because of siege or something like that. But on the other way, on the other hand, though, a magical disease like Grayscale could just totally ravage the city. The show gave us a brief foray, foray into the Grayscale plot, but not really enough to give us clues as to what's going to happen on the show, other than... Things happened in Old Town, right? Like Sam and Jorah were there together and, well, it wasn't the most interesting subplot, but the, the fact that they put it there might indicate that things will happen there in the books as well. Here's a, uh, here's a quote from the ponderous man with the ponderous tome himself. Sir Jamie, I have seen terrible things in my time, the old man said. Wars, battles, murders most foul. I was a boy in Old Town when the Grey Plague took half the city and three quarters of the Citadel. Lord Hightower burned every ship in port, closed the gates, and commanded his guards to slay all those who tried to flee, be they men, women, or babes in arms. They killed him when the plague had run its course. On the very day he reopened the port, they dragged him from his horse and slit his throat and his young sons as well. To this day, the ignorant in Old Town will spit at the sound of his name, but Quentin Hightower did what was needed. Hmm, interesting. So this is Pycelle's youth, which was a while ago because Pycelle is up there, but not that long ago in terms of historical terms. Half the city to the Grey Plague, and, uh, and about 150 years earlier, a quarter of it was lost to the Shivers. So we got several different examples here of, of Old Town getting hit really hard by magical disease. Well, I'm assuming the Shivers is magical. It isn't necessarily. But in uh, any case, the, the great grayscale certainly is, I would think. And, well, hmm, that's got to be interesting. We've got to see where that's going to go. I wonder. I very much wonder. I mean, obviously, John Connington isn't anywhere near Old Town at this point. But, oh, it's a matter of just it's starting to spread. And then it's, if it starts to spread just in general, then it's only a matter of time before it hits all the ports. But uh, the grayscale plot's interesting because a lot of people just have struggle with seeing where it's going to go. I feel confident that it's going to be a pretty big deal, but I also agree that I don't know where it's going to go. Like, I don't know how it's going to be resolved or what it actually does for the story other than making things even more horrible. But I'm confident it's going to be a big deal. But it's also not exactly the main topic here, so let us move on a bit. Uh, yeah, so let's talk about the meta and our, our dreaming on what could happen a, a bit. Mm -hmm. um, the fact is that George R. Martin is a gardener, right? That's his style. And the house gardener? <laughs> that's right, to use that metaphor and that house name here. He's just left a lot untouched with House Hightower and Old Town. So in terms of gardening style, he's given himself a lot of room for the seeds he's planted to sprout in a variety of possible ways. I mean, the Hightower itself, we, don't, we haven't been in it. We, we've heard very little about it other than how big it is and some rumors about what's in it. But we don't know what it looks like on the inside. Or we talked about this possible library they have in there. Imagine climbing all of those stairs. Oh, my God. <laughs> I hope they have, like, a slide to go down. You know, like, you have to climb up, but you just slide on down. <laughs> and it's notable. It's like, wee. <laughs> and it's notable, too, that, that the Hightowers in Old Town have featured so much in this supplemental material. They're, all, they're in the world of Ice and Fire a lot. They're in Fire and Blood a lot. Like you, you said yourself, they're one of the most mentioned families. Old Town is, you know, among the most mentioned places. Mm -hmm. And that just sounds like George is giving it more detail because it's going to get more important. And there's just plenty of reason to think that. Yeah, I, I think the High Towers will be more important. I think clearly Old Town will be. 
But I do think that it could also be an example of him showing the rise and fall of houses. Yeah, yeah, you're you right. Know, the idea that the high towers aren't as powerful as they were before because, you know. It, um, it, yeah, the high towers could either, there's a lot of ways it could go, like you say. Like it could go, the high towers could become almost nothing after this. Or they could still maintain some political power, just a lot less. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, they could, there's a lot of, there's in between here because Euron could smash the citadel take something he wants and leave or just slaughter a bunch of people and leave or he could like you say there's it's not that likely to hold the city but there's a, there's a chance he does that yeah, too who would even I, i'm like who would he put in charge of old town if he left yeah, it's a tough call yeah it's good, <laughs> the reader <laughs> it's a city with books and learning put the reader in charge the reader would be like yes please i'll totally take that gimme 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 <laughs> but don't burn those books man yeah, that's probably the Citadel's the thing I'm the most worried about out of all of Old Town. All oh, those books, man. Save yeah, especially the books. after we heard all about Sarnor and, you know, their big library that was burned. Yeah. Like, yeah. Tragedy, tragedy. So here's um here's some more quotes we have relevant to the Citadel and what we think might mm -hmm. be uh found there. Um here yeah. so we're gonna start with just yeah. ideas of what Sam could find there just there's so many possible just use your imagination any book that he could find a book on valyria book on the doom anything book on the children of the forest just use your imagination sam george could put anything he wants there and it's the possibilities are endless so let's uh let's go there ourselves for a minute shall we uh, read the quote queen alisan remained in old town the silent sisters hosted her in their mother house for a day of prayer and contemplation Another day she spent with the septas who cared for the city's sick and destitute. For three days she lost herself in the Citadel's great library, emerging only to attend lectures on the Valyrian Dragon Wars, Leechcraft, and the gods of the Summer Isles. Nice. Some interesting <laughs> subjects right there. I know, just right there. It's like, whoo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we've, we've got that, uh, some interesting subjects. Then Alan Oakenfist looks at some books there, too. So we've got... Alan Oakenfist enjoyed the hospitality of the High Tower, explored the ancient winds and ways of Old Town, and visited the Citadel, where he spent days poring over ancient charts and studying dusty Valyrian treatises about warship design and tactics for battle at sea. The tactics for battle at sea is one of the things I wonder if if Leighton could be looking at, you know, because Euron's sh proving himself to be a really effective seaman, and um, in fact, Victorian at one point talks about Euron using wizards when it's really just a f seamanship. He's like, oh, they didn't, he didn't stick to the shore like we always did. He used, he, he, he used the winds and it, yeah. they're, they're saying it's magic, but it's really just good seamanship. And so I wonder if that's, uh, you know, the same sort of magic being, or, or just education being brushed off as magic because people don't understand it. It's entirely mm -hmm. possible here. So here's another quote that's interesting. Yeah. His lordship sat with the scribes and maesters of the citadel so they might set down the details of his voyage, was feted by the masters of the seven guilds, and received yet another blessing from the high septon. So there I think is interesting. I mean, we hear about two, at, le at least two different books that are based on Alan Oakenfish that are reputed to be more or less accurate. And so obviously we can see how those books were written when he did spend that time. But also the masters of the seven guilds. Yeah, what is that? Yeah, we haven't really heard about That's that. That's a great before. example of what I was saying before. There's a lot of like casually thrown around stuff about Old Town that doesn't seem to be terribly important, but it, it, it with you know it, it could be like a big rabbit hole. Yeah, you I know, mean, this yeah, is it makes like, sense. Hmm. Seven faith the seven, but it really makes you wonder like what would the seven items be? The seven guilds. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's food for thought. What culture? Yeah, what cultural you know or merchant mercantilism or whatever things? What do they value here? Like, what are the? Yeah. You know. What are the, what is the high tower support? <laughs> but you also gave us this cool list. You grabbed some of these a bunch yeah. of cool sounding books. And yeah, these are my the ones I'm most interested in at least. Like there's one Wed to the Sea, being an account of the history of White Harbor from its earliest days, mm. which obviously we did our episode on the Ma House Manderley and talked a lot about White Harbor. So yeah. man, I wish we had that for that episode. That would have been <laughs> we would have had the best possible Manderley episode if we had this book. And then let's see when 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 women ruled, ladies of the aftermath. Yeah. Goes without saying why I'm interested in that. This yeah. all these women after the dance of the dragons, including Sam Tarly. That's right. <laughs> Some good old Samantha. And we did our episode on Nymeria. 
We sure needed 10,000 ships. That's right. It's 10 times more than Euron's show fleet. <laughs> Here's one that uh, Aziz would probably be pretty interested in is in addition to me. The testimony of Mushroom? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in addition to one Heck more, yes. I think we're both super interested oh, in. Oh, yeah. Maester Theron's Strange Stone, yeah. which is the oily black stone we referenced earlier in the episode. And then, of course, there's Dragons, Worms, and Wyverns. They're on Natural History, written by good old Septon Barth himself. Uh, the man, the myth, the legend. Yeah. And then Blood and Fire, also known as the Death of Dragons, which is hidden away in a locked vault beneath the Citadel. And... So that's that's notable. Everyone thinks of, yeah. Jockin is going after that, yeah. don't they? I, I'm in, I'm included in everyone who who thinks that. <laughs> and I think this is the most famous of all the books mentioned in Fire and Blood: A Caution for Young Girls. <laughs> Somehow it's the most. Famous. Yeah, it's the erotic tales of uh, Corianne <laughs> Wilde and everywhere she went. And I think we all need that in our lives, especially Sam Tarley. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you can see that's just a sampling. Just if we re- like super brainstorm we could just come up with so many more possible ones like those are actual titles named in, yeah. the, in the stories but or in, some in of them are named also some of them are named also obviously in, in worlds in the main series like Ten Thousand ships but they're often named in both so there's just there's it's just if we imagine not just specific books or or uh, random books we can we can think of other things that could happen like in the tv show they revealed that Rhaegar and Lyanna were married and that might be where this is happens as well. I mean, I think Bran will will see the visions, and we have Hal and Reed as well. But the proof of their marriage might be needed for people who don't believe in Bran's visions, or who don't trust Hal and Reed, or whatever. You might need proof from multiple sources, uh, and to make sure the reader believes it themselves. Uh, we can also get info on others: children of the forest, giants, krakens, direwolves, werewolves, Valyrian steel, dragon glass, dragon steel. Uh, grayscale, of course, we brought that up already, but there should be literature written on it. There should be books in the Citadel about grayscale. Certainly Sam had one of those on the show. <laughs> and though it's easy to focus on those bigger, like sexier plot lines. Grayscale there's... sexy to you? Uh, maybe a poor choice of words. Mm. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's enormous potential for smaller mysteries and bits of backstory to get wrapped up or at least expanded on. Like Sam could read more about Alyssa Farman, for yeah. example. I just, want that. That's not a plot heavy thing, but we so many of us want it, right? <laughs> you know? And George could give us that. He could give us more about Sothorios or Ulthos or Imagine George R. Here's one of my this is headcanon, even though I don't know that it's super likely. Imagine George R. R. Martin deciding to have Sam reading about the faceless men while like Pate, who is actually Jockin, is like hanging out nearby. Like, hey, Sam, what are you reading? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm reading about the Faceless Men of Bravos. Oh, how interesting. I don't know anything about them. Nothing whatsoever. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but on the other hand, because we keep talking about Euron, how much time does Sam actually have? Does he have time to read a bunch of books? Does, like we said, do the High Towers have time to get involved in these politics? Do they even have time to support Aegon? It all is going to depend. It's all going to hinge on the Euron problem. So let's talk about that a bit. Now, Old Town is preparing for, uh, for war. We have a quote here. Baylor is building ships. Gunthor building up the harbor's defenses. Garth Greysteel training men. And Humphrey is traveling to his sister Lanesse in Lease, where he hopes to hire cell sales. The Ironborn have conquered parts of the harbor and are attempting to blockade the Honeywine. One attack on the harbor has already been repulsed by the defenders, but Old Town remains under threat. So, as we've said, there's so many different ways that it could go. Euron could not succeed. He could succeed partially. He could succeed thoroughly. But if he does succeed thoroughly, what is his goal? That, we have no idea. Whether he wants the wealth of the place for his ends. He doesn't want it for its own sake. We know he's not a big, someone who cares a lot about having wealth for wealth's sake. And uh, what if he's able to capture some high towers as, as hostages? Or... Uh, what if Leighton Hightower actually does use magic? What if, uh, as we see in the 2020 calendar, <laughs> he actually summons deep ones? <laughs> Seems kind of unlikely, but, you know, it is suggested that they're, uh, someone's, someone gives the line that uh, maybe they're looking up how to raise an army from the deeps. And, well, seems like a stretch, but I would love to see it happen. 
Another character who we are wondering about, or actually a couple of characters, besides Hightowers as hostages, uh, Sam is there. He's not a great example because Randall doesn't care about him, and he's already taken the black. But uh, maybe Randall Tarley might not take kind would not not take kindly to to uh, an attack on his family. That's the kind of even even Tywin, you know, who doesn't like Tyrion, responded to Catelyn seizing Tyrion. So most of the noble kids are at the Citadel. There's a bunch of them, though, right? We know that noble families send their kids to the Citadel. Not their first sons, but their second, third, and fourth, whatever. So there's some unnamed ones there, but there's also Leo Tyrell, who we know for sure, and Sorella Sand. So here's another little bit of where we kind of wrap in the TV show just a little bit. The fight between Sand Snakes and Euron on the show seems kind of out of place for the books, but the idea of him capturing one of them if you consider the elements in play here, which is Old Town, the Citadel, and Euron threatening it, then, well, he could capture Sorella. And so that, what we saw on TV of him capturing, uh, which was the one he left alive to give to Cersei? I forget. Um, doesn't matter. What? I'm sorry. Which Sand Snake did he capture to give to Cersei? I forget which one he left in alive. In the show? Tyene? Was it Tyene? Yeah. Tyene, okay. And, and Alaria, of course. Yeah, so not that it would be Tyene here, but yeah. this is we could have a... A, Certain, a parallel to yeah. that plot of you're on yeah. taking Sorella captive and doing whatever. Yeah. At, at this point, there's nothing that the Sand Snakes have done, at, at least especially not her, that Cersei needs to get revenge true, on with. True, true. But yeah, if, if you assume Nymeria and Tyene kill Tommen or... Yeah, you, we could see it going there eventually. Mm -hmm. But I think it's less likely to be Sorella. Yeah, but it does have the merit. You're right. There's some problems with this theory. Another problem is that she's in disguise. How is Euron even going to know who she is? Unless she reveals it in order to maybe get better treatment because nobles can expect better treatment when they're captured. Um, although that may not be true in Euron's yeah. case. She may not know that. She's just a teenager, so she's not going to have, you know, a, a lifetime's worth, of, a full lifetime's worth of wisdom to use, even if anyone's wisdom would, would really matter here in a spot like that. But it, it would at least from a story perspective, resolve why Sorella is at the Citadel in the first place. I mean, I have never seen a theory for why Sorella is at the Citadel that I think is a really strong idea. I'm just, it's just a baffling thing. Like, what is she doing there? I personally, I think it's actually pretty open and shut. She's just a curious girl. She just wants to learn and go study at the Citadel. So study there, she needs to pretend to be a man. I, I like, I don't think it needs, like, It'll turn out that she's gotten herself into a, a bigger problem because all, you know, Euron's coming and there's a whole host of other things. Jockin's here. Like, there's more going on there. That it doesn't, she's... yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Although it's like, that doesn't exactly tell us where he's going with her character. Like, that doesn't, that's not her arc. You know what I mean? Yeah, it like, doesn't tell us her arc, but we just have barely met her enough to see what yeah. her arc could be. It's just that you're, you're right. I mean, there's just so many other characters that we we feel like we have a good sense of where they're going. She just seems to be one of the ones that I am the most confused about. Not that it's a bad thing, just I find myself without theories. And the fandom lacks theories, too, and that's yeah. interesting. You know, just the fact that we are all kind of confused as to what she's up to. So that's cool. Like the Sphinx bit too is like, yeah. it just makes it all more confusing. <laughs> like the Sphinx is the riddle, not the riddle or, or, you know, and yeah. uh, Sam's like, do you, have you heard that before? And she's like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. So uh, we had the, whoever's question it was before, I think it was, uh, I forget. Who was that? Um, yeah. Was it? I can't find it. Oh, wait, here we go. It was uh, K to the Canals was wondering about the uh, the Pirate Lord thing foreshadowing for Euron. Yeah, that's really interesting because we're told that in the really, really ancient days, really like super ancient days, that the honey wine uh, was held by a Pirate Lord who would just pillage all the ships that passed by. And a lot of people... Uh, have wondered if that is related to or is foreshadowing for Euron. If Euron takes Old Town and holds it, he could just start looting ever, all the ships that come by instead of trading with them until, you know, eventually word would get out, don't go to Old Town. But for quite a while, people wouldn't know that Old Town has been taken by Euron. Uh, it would take a while for, for that news to spread. And in the meantime, he could, you know, enrich himself even further. Of course, he would use that money for political purposes, not for his own purposes, not for wealth. But... It's, it's an interesting idea to consider, given that uh, George presented it in that light. So, hmm, yeah, I don't know. It's very, very confusing. We're well, not confusing so much as uh, 
compelling and, and hard to predict. Now, we early to, earlier we talked about Euron having ma cleverness and maybe, maybe even flat out magic to get around all these uh, ancient uh, defenses and tactics that the High Towers have developed over the years that have worked so well. And that could be countered, though. We've talked about how he might get around that. But what if Lord Leighton and the Mad Maid have some sort of counter magic for him? That would be interesting. I mean, we are apparently heading towards a, a story that has more magic than it did have. So that could be, um, I mean, I don't know about wizard battles, that kind of thing. But we could see spells on both sides, which would be really quite interesting. Um, so. Let's see. We've got this uh, third Q&A, a couple of questions, just a couple of questions left over, and then we are done. I'm trying to type a message here, and I just can't send it. But anyways, we've had a conversation about caution for young girls and about the idea of female authors in the series. And to be clear, there were plenty of female authors historically, like throughout history. Yeah. Um, there were plenty. But the point I was making in response to Nina that I, I my keyboard just isn't working and I'm really frustrated is that uh, I think George is specifically a lot of the time playing with what people consider to be popular history. Yes. Um, sometimes I, totally I don't think he knows the reality for all of the history he puts in there. I think yeah. sometimes he is one of the people that thinks of popular history as this is the case. He might. Um, he might. In but certain other, cases. And, but other times I think he's playing with public perception. Yeah. Um, so maybe he actually doesn't realize there were that many female authors in these times. And maybe. so yeah. and that. But maybe he is playing with the idea that people didn't realize that there were all of those. I don't know whether it excuses it, but I he has talked about that in the past. Yeah, I lean towards him uh, writing it the way that the, the, the people in the world would th see it, which is they would also be largely ignorant of how good the you know, writing yeah. powers of women could be. Yeah. For like, uh, you would think that people like Gildane and other people would know of these books at this point, but I don't know. But they're, they're, the Citadel reinforces this sexism that they have, you know? So yeah. like a lot of maesters would look down yeah. on women because they are told that women aren't good enough to be there with them. Yeah. And uh, so that goes a long way towards describing. Um, and Nina says, it doesn't excuse it for me. I'm not telling you it has to excuse it for you. I'm just telling you uh, my perspective on it in that, yeah, well, no one's yeah. trying to absolve yeah. or congratulate George here. This yeah. isn't about, we're not trying to, this isn't about, um, this isn't about that. We're analyzing the text. We're not yeah. trying to, we're not analyzing George. Aaron Ginsberg says, Gildane is a parody of male historian. Yeah, kind of is. Yeah. 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 That's the, and I think that might be the point. Yeah. Or that might be the, the exact point. Yeah, yeah. That George is trying to do, um, which is, if, if that's accurate, it's a clever thing to do. Um, I'm sure some people would have done it a different way. It's fair to say he may not have done it perfectly. In fact, he could have done it a lot better, probably. But uh, it's hard to know without knowing his motivation. And w without knowing his motivation, it's hard to come down on him or praise him. Um, but anyway, like I said, that is not exactly our focus today. But we are pretty much done. That's, uh, we've, we've raised these questions about Euron. We've, we've gone through a lot of the ancient history. And we've talked about a lot of the possibilities for what's coming with, the, with Old Town and the High Towers. And uh, we're very excited. There's so many cool things coming, so many possibilities. It is not a straight line from here to the end. We do not know. There's so many, uh, so many unresolved plots from the TV show as well that just never came to Old Town or the High Towers. I don't even think the High Towers were mentioned in the TV show, were they? Probably not. Uh, I mean, the High Tower was, I, but the High Tower was. But I'm trying to think about in the histories and lore. Yeah, they probably came up in the in the in the, in the histories and lore. I just the main TV show, though, maybe not. <clears throat> anyway, okay, well, let's do some thanks. Thank you all for coming to be with us live today and celebrating Ashea's birthday. Community shines through at times like this. It's a reminder of, of how lucky we are to be talking to y'all today and all the other days. You know. It's just, uh, we have a great time doing this. It's very fun, and, and we're thankful. So, yeah, appreciate y'all coming. Appreciate you liking and subscribing and spreading the word. And we certainly thank those of y'all who are patrons, because that makes the world go around for us. Thanks also to Michael Klarfeld for the maps. Not just the map behind us, but the map on your body. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. Thanks to Joey Townsend and Jesse Kowal for our music. And here are some patron shout-outs to close us out. 
Thank you to the mysterious BR, Hand of the King, Lord Stephen Stark, titles, titles, Hand of Queen Ashea, who is known as the best, Lord Jim the Fortuitous of Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire blog and Warden of the West, Lord George Stormsville the Cunning is Lord of the Chiliad and Warden of the East, Cabeth the Unfrozen is Lord of the Bricks and Castle Crimson Light, Defender of the Old Gods and Warden of the North. Lady Kelly McMath of Covington is Lady of the Villa Hills and Crescent Springs, Warden of the South. Lord James Tuttle, King of the Stepstones and the Narrow Sea, Commander of the Royal Fleet, consisting of the Narrow Fleet led by flagship Caraxes, and the Bloodstone Fleet led by flagship Prince Damon, is wisely staying entirely out of all the wars coming south of Dorne, meaning the naval engagements of Euron and the Arbor and all that. He's going to wait to see who wins and then make a move. King Beyond the Wall, Sidney Jesse, is the Fallborn, Lord of Blue Spring and the Haunted Forest, wields a dagger of dragonglass, and the Valyrian steel blade, Red Frost, is really just confused about why anyone cares about Old Town. Who the hell would want to be around all those people? That's the attitude of a wildling. Lady Sarah Connolly, the Willful, motto wit beyond measure is man's greatest treasure, is also Jenny's patron. Yeah, by the way, y'all, I, I posted to Patreon, I posted a um, an update to learning Jenny's song. I've, I've got the melody worked out a bit, and I'm I just got myself a new capo because some of the fingerings are difficult. So making progress there, y'all. I'll be delivering that at some point. White Walker patrons include First Walker Tanneman, wielder of Blue Sister, went north of the wall in search of the most refreshing brew, where the mountains are always blue. Turned White Walker, but still in search for the elusive Blue Mountains. Can't rest until I complete my quest. Araya Flint of the Mountain Flints is captured by the Weeper, only to be raised in the Valley of the Milkwater. Blue eyes and golden memories. Alexander Greyblood, first of the first men, now crowned in ice, called Silence Bringer, Wood Blinder, and the Snow of Night, wielder of the ice forged greatsword Pale Frost. Our small councils led by Lord Daniel the Sneaky Russian, Master of Ships, Grand Maester Via James, Lord Benjamin of House Hornwood, Master of Laws, Lord Fabian Flowers, the Bastard of Green Shield, Master of Coin, and Lord Johan of House Orcos, called Shadowhawk, is Master of Whispers. Lords and ladies in their castles include Lady Diarliz of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron, Lord Dan of the Red Mountains and Castle Great Bell as Breaker of the Second Stone, Gregor the Toasty, Lord of the Delicious Breadfort, <laughs> Lord Ryan of Castle Stonegate is Guardian of the Rocky Mountain Pass, Ashlyn Winter the Hawk's Eye is Lady of Castle Skyfall, Lady Mikkel of Moonacre is Leader of the Werewood Protectorate Alliance, the Lord of the Halls of Castle Hillcrest is Wielder of the Valyrian Steel Machete Everglazed, Lord Alistair Whitaker is Lord of the Donhold. Lord Bemmy Snuggle Bunny is Guardian Ranger of the Hidden Hundred Acre Werewood, dual wielder of Valyrian Short Swords, Glorious Morning, and Little Light Wise, sharpshooter of the Werewood and Ironwood Laminated Longbow, Todd Von Oven. When you fear things cannot get worse, Snuggle Bunny enters the fray. Also, he's teaching me how to be better at speaking because that one's really hard to read. <sighs> so it's like practice. <laughs> the bastard of the Werewood, of the Wolfswood, rather, is First Forester of the Old Gods. He is sworn to House Iron Werewood. Listen for the silence. Lady Liana Kelly of Wolf Island leads the protectors of the Steelhold. Casey Stark is of House Acres. Lady Kay of House Archer is Lady of Earth Dog Hall, Huntress of the Wolfswood, and Guardian of Maddie Squirrel's Bane, the Mighty Direweenie. Lady Raywin of House Dillsdane is the Star Spear. Peter Rivers is the Pale Dragon and heir to Blood Raven. Lady Carlin Carey of Castle Stone Sharp, whose horse is shod in Valyrian steel, is Lady Rider of the Rising Hills. Lord Brendan Lannister is the Blood Lion, ruler of Castle Everroar. Our first sword. Oops, I mean, our King's Justice, rather, is Sir Troy the Steady, wielder of the Valyrian Steel Blade Fate, and our Queen's High Council. Has Bloody Ben Blackwood, Master of Whispers, Rebea Star Eyes, Lady of Waves, and Mistress of Ships, Captain of the Iron Shadow Cat, in the shadows we bear our claws, Catrin the Wise of House Trondheim, Master of Coin, Grand Maester M. Elizabeth, Middle Daughter of Lyanna Mormont, First Lady to Forge both the Silver and Valyrian Steel Link, and Laura Boros, the Lady of Infinity, Master of Laws. And our King's Guard, led by Lord Commander Miriam R., backed up by Sir Dolores D., longest tenured white sword, Sir Dean the White, Knight of the Black Star, Sir Jord of House Pepsi, the Beverage Knight, Gregor Snow, called Snow Bear, a bastard of Winterfell, Sir Glennon of House Leanne, called Lion Cloak, and Sir Jen Seaworth, Knight of the Southern Snows. Did we get a couple of last super chats yes, in there? Yes, we did. Were they birthday wishes? Yes, they were. Very nice. Well, who do we have to thank? Kate of the Canal said, happy birthday, Ash. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And Lady Dillsdale, also known as... <laughs> the Star Spear. Yeah, the Star Spear. <laughs> happy birthday, Queen Ashea. Cool. Good to see you there, Lady Dillsdale. And, uh, yeah, let's do our... Let's do your Queen's Guard now. 
Lord Captain Commander Hema Helmint, the Sellsword Sentinel, Alexander of House Atreides, from the Seat of Dune, I must not fear, fear is the mind killer, Becca the Bard, Songbird of the North, Michonne the Melodious, Star of Old Town, Minds over masters. You, I cannot tell you how many times I've wanted to say minds over maesters. Minds over maesters is such a really would be a good way to say, to say it, it too. Upon, yeah, I have. <laughs> uh, Sir Rambo, Knight of House Ganon, First Blood. Mm -hmm. Sir Leon of House Walker, wielder of the twin Valyrian steel blades, Fire and Ice, and the Werewood Bow, Rain. And Amber the Adamant, the Knight of the Mist, and Mother of Squids. Right on. Our beard guard is led by Lord Commander George the Golden, backed up by Sir Joshua Oakhart the White Oak, Lady Rita of the Copper Main, the Unbound, Dance the Fervor. Hey, Rita. Sir Jeff, Warden of the AC, wielder of Triad, the multifaceted beard of Platinum, red and brown, motto, stay frosty. Sir Tim Corgyle is Mad Boy of the Western Desert. And a few more for fun. We got Maester Luscious or Lucius of the Alluvia. We got Archmaester Austin, whose ring and rod and mask are made of oily black stone. That's appropriate. We got Reese the Renewer, the Lady of Ash and Rebirth. And we've got a uh, few more new ones here. Scrolling, scrolling. Sir Jorgen of Bloodstone, the Night Knight. Fair Cat, the provider called Lady Bakes. Um, we have our members of the History of Westeros Night's Watch, Lord Commander Benjen Umber, the Silent Giant, wielder of the Valyrian Steel Greatsword Winter's Kiss, First Builder Magor Snow, a.k.a. Magor the Cool, the Fire in the Snow, First Steward Sir Jurion of the Torrentine called Pale Wind, and First Ranger Sor Source Delica of House Gramercy. And a few more new people who have signed up within the last few months. We got another super chat. Oh, too. cool. From Sheila Hilton, who said, happy birthday, fellow Leo. Oh, cool. Another ha a fellow birthday person. Excellent. Happy That's birthday cool. to you as well, whether an early birthday or a belated birthday. Right on. Right on. Uh, we have Ed Snow, a.k.a. Ned the Knife, the Bastard of White Harbor. Uh, Shanley the She-Wolf of House Clark, Wisdom of the Pack. Lady Lauren Blackwood, Voice of the Old Gods, a sound sweeter than silence. And last but not least, Lady Colleen the Escalator, she who hits first. <laughs> Lady Kalara the Bard, first beacon of voices. And Mati, the multifaceted, banned from the Citadel, yet still called Maester Mati. Mm -hmm. That is it for everything today. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for liking and subscribing, sharing, and spreading the word in any way you can, whether it's financial or not. We appreciate it very much. And we will see you all next time. Valar Reredus.